Why We Bleep is sponsored by Signal Sounds. Hello everyone, just want to let you know that I um, had a very successful month, was able to pick up my new modular synth at last, and uh, uh, of course, as you know, I got it from Signal Sound. It's actually a System 8880 uh, with a Mordax data. I've got a Zvex uh, distortion, which is excessive, uh, I would say. Um, all of this is bound together by tendrils cables, which are right-angled, so I'm able to close my case patched. And really, I've topped it off with um, what I would only describe as an insane level of distortion from the Bastel Dark Matter um, and Moffin's Eve. Uh, you know, the very odd, very odd man, that man. This is all panned, of course, by the Antimatter V3KT and unwashed, you know, in delay, which is from the Animal Factory, Kona delay, which is actually made in India. And of course, uh, as you know, uh, signal signs were able to get it to me very quickly, within 48 hours. And of course, I live in India, so there you have it. For all your modular needs, contact retailer Signal Sounds. Their website is signalsounds.com. Once again, signalsounds.com. Why We Bleep is also sponsored by thonk.co.uk. Modular is amazing, but sure as a chicken riding a bicycle, it can get expensive, mate. So if you're thinking of going modular, or getting more modular, and can't afford it, have you thought about the magic of DIY. Yes, you need to be checking out the sweet DIY wares of Thonk in Brighton. Described by today's guest as a hardware record label, Thonk sells ready-to-go parts, PCBs, panels, and best of all, full and complete kits from a huge range of immensely cool and interesting brands. And Thonk puts them in one super easy-to-shop spot. It's the official home of the legendary Music Thing Turing Machine, which every system should have, if you ask me. <laughs> and if you think DIY is hard or scary, know that I know absolutely nothing about how circuits work, and yet have built many a kit from Thonk successfully using me bare hands. YouTube will teach you to solder, and the rest is like Lego, only louder. So have fun building your own modules, MIDI controllers, desktop synths, and all manner of electronic music shenanigans, and save cash doing it at thunk.co.uk. And the first five folks to use coupon code WHYWEBLEEP2019 can save 10% on their order at thunk.co.uk. Today is a very special day, because it's not just any old January, it's the January after we first started doing Why We Bleeps, meaning it's been a year of bleeping, which is very exciting. Let me tell you, there have been many conversations with many awesome and interesting people, and we roll the clocks back, and we start again. And what better person to start again than the person that we interviewed in the very first episode. So, I'm very proud and excited to be able to present another conversation with Tom Whitwell from Music Thing Modular. More on him in a moment. I know what you're excited about, and it must be Nam. Yes, not Vietnam, the awful terrible war, but the wonderful music technology trade show in America, in Anaheim, which is where I'm about to discover all the new, exciting, wonderful, amazing things that will come out during the next year. It's always a very exciting time, and I get to go, which is awesome. So if you're at NAM, you may well see me wandering around and come and say hello, and I will be trying to feast my eyes and hands on all of the new things. I know about some of them, and they're very exciting, but there's obviously lots that I don't know about, which is even more exciting. So... It kind of sounds pretty awesome so far. We've had things from Teenage Engineering. We've had the new stuff from Korg. I think it's going to be quite a good one. I think there's going to be some good stuff. So, eyes on the prize, but mainly the amazingness of a year. One whole year. Um, um, gee. Although November was a skip over month because I was moving house. And in fact, actually, I've only just got the studio sorted out. And I'd like to shout out you, Rachel. 
my wife listening to this now who have been truly sensational in helping me sort out my studio because I'm not a naturally tidy person um, and she is and she rules for tidy ups. So the studio has gone from absolute hell bomb to genuinely kind of an awesome creative space although nothing's plugged in yet i did just get a new mixer which is very exciting and actually what you're hearing me through now i've got quite a random choice a sec sec 1882 mark ii which um i don't know if many of you or some of you will know sec but it is a i didn't know about it it's a british brand that was basically part of bandai who made the great british spring um and basically the sex the sex, the sex were affordable mixers in the pre Mackey era. So like mid eighties, late eighties, these were like budget mixers, but really tricked out. Um, and they're very compact, relatively speaking. So the SEC 1882 is an 18 channel mixer, but you've got like eight groups, you've got loads of sends and you've got returns on the things. So you don't have to use up channels. Um, it's got inserts on all of the channels. You've got tape returns on the channels as well, which just makes it very useful um, for DAW based returning of tracks. If you want to use it as a summing mixer, it's very quiet. I mean, it's not quiet. It's not perfect, but in the scheme of mixers, it's pretty quiet quiet and um it distorts nicely you can probably hear me distorting it now um and i've got my rnla going into this channel as an insert gosh shout out to insert cables been a few years since i've had one of those in my hands so it's just generally quite good um and i'm excited about i'm basically going to plug all my hardware into this sec mixer and then kind of use the sec mixer to submix and then probably multi-track to the computer and using the circlon which we talk about in the episode a bit but the circlon is the master sequencer because i've got all of this hardware and to be brutally honest with you i tend to keep hardware and the computer world separate you will hear me mention an album that i've completed and that album whilst it uses hardware in part is a real testament to when i use a computer i just i don't know about you i just use the computer and i use plugins and software you know software plugin vst instruments and effects i tend not to bounce through hardware although a little bit but i mainly just use the computer because i just want to work quick get stuff done it's not necessary to involve all the hardware for what i'm doing at least for the project that i was making it just wasn't and I find it counterproductive because you get in rabbit holes and you distract yourself when you should just be working quickly. Just get the music done um, or compartmentalize the process so that you do the sound design on a computer or you do the writing on the computer and then you do sound design later. I mean, that's a good way of doing it. But the, my plan is to do a load of hardware music and I've actually got a lot of hardware samplers. I've got all this hardware that I've accumulated over the years and I want to make it useful and um, having a desk and having this circle on is part of that. So 2019 for me is going to be an exploration of doing stuff with this kind of hardware set up as a music writing rig. Very much like my modular is just a little music writing rig while well, I've made a music modular music writing rig out of hardware. So we've got to just plug it all in. So thanks, Rach. Um, you were awesome at helping me sort this out and make it pleasant. Um, yes, so... Our chat with Tom Twitwell, um, Tom Whitwell, who I have introduced a year ago. And if you listen to the very first episode of Why We Bleep, it's obviously with Tom. Tom is a synth manufacturer, um, but I think he probably somewhat bulk at that term in the sense that Tom is, a, I think, first and foremost, just a, a journalist, consultant, enthusiast. He makes modules, but it's not his full-time job, it's a kind of hobby that through Thonk, which thank you for sponsoring the episode, but Thonk sell Tom's kits. And actually Thonk and Tom are very tied, you know, in the sense that basically the the cheering machine was the product that kind of launched Thonk. And anyway, it's just a way of saying that that, that his designs have been widely adopted um, and, you know, form a, a huge part of their business, I'm sure. Um, but just hanging out with Tom is just really an opportunity to just dweeb out about all manner of other things. Tom is a journalist and a person just fascinated by the stories, the kind of um, ancillary histories and, and, and personalities. And, and he's just deeply interested in electronic music 
and just music in general and the people and the stories that they all have. So we talk a lot about this. Um, what else do we talk about? Oh, God, loads. I made a list. The Professor of Chaos, meeting John Chowning and playing the DX7. We actually do play his DX7 Mark II in this um, and play some truly incredible vocal presets that he's got. We talk about 2018 and the Behringer Clone Wars. We talk about the increasing cost of electronics manufacturing and the potential dangers for the music technology industry. We play with surface mount parts, he gets them out, and we have a gentle argument about the Mannequins modules and Mannequins marketing in general. Um, sorry, Mannequins, you are awesome, but I'm just a dick. Uh, and Tom expounds on his love and hate for a particular module. We talk about how Eurorack has become a shopping scene, less of a technique scene. That's something we should all work on in 2019. We talk about the temptation of feature creep, especially if you have a microprocessor in your module and it's tempting to just add features, ad infinitum. And I suppose that gives you some hints about stuff he's been developing. We talk about keeping a diary. We talk about discussing the frogs of Hearn Hill. We read from John Cage's diary. We pick through some of his bookshelves. Tom gets his favourite book out, which we read. He talks about his year's work in the fashion industry, decommissioned Synthy 100s. He gets his Nagra out. We play with some tape loops. We talk about Beardy Man his favourite music on recording and not recording music, and his brutal theory on modular releases. And as a summary, we discuss lessons I've learned from a year's Why We Bleepin'. It's been a good year. I think 2019 is going to be even better. But first, Tom will. Thanks. Uh, that, that feedback loop concept is something that I think analog. Isn't it true? I mean, you actually know about this stuff. That like analog electronics, like filters, things like that. There are certain kind of like um, networks that you can build that really are very hard to simulate in like the digital world. That like yeah. only analog electronics like make that practical, or like the the way of exploiting it is simple in the analog domain, but very hard to simulate in the digital. Does that make sense? So I don't. I don't know. To what extent that's true, but the 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 thing that amazed me when I was starting to learn about it was that um, so you know feedback like you know it when you have a microphone and it squeals. Mm. It was realizing that that is what an oscillator is doing. Oscillators really? are just microphones really held it to a speaker. Well, they're they're yeah they're essentially as I understand it, basically they are feedback loops that are very carefully carefully you know managed i think that's one way of understanding they, them where does the original signal come from that starts the feedback going i don't think i don't think you need it if you i don't think you need it if you've got if you i mean it's obviously a high gain kind of thing but feedback mm. is a massive part of all that all those circuits work in that kind of way but the chaotic thing you're talking about mm. is so at the at the cv freaks event the other day i interviewed I wanted to work out how you could get people from other countries into it. <laughs> into CV um, Freaks. Into CV Freaks. And I, I was initially thinking, you know, there's lots of interesting people in China. There's interesting... There was a, there's a guy in in Baghdad who's the kind of only modular synth guy in Baghdad. I thought it'd be great to, you know, interview them and get them in. But thought I should start with something simpler, never having done done it. So well, I got... actually organise the event. Right? Yeah. So I, I kind of curate the talks bit of that. Oh, okay. And so I said, um, I asked Andrew, who does nonlinear circuits, yeah. um, if he would be up for doing it. And it was it, it worked really well. We had him basically on Skype, right? Okay, on the big screen with me kind of interviewing him, but him in his workshop in Perth on his wow. phone wandering around. Nice. So he starts by giving me a tour of his workshop, which is just completely full of amazing weird old stuff so he's got he he's got a lot of relationship with the university in perth he's got weird analog um analog computers from there he's Brilliant. got just all this stuff he's been building you know surge clone stuff he's built and his circuit his, his phd was about um uh chaos so he did he did an engineering an electrical engineering kind of degree uh and got to the end of the degree and was like, oh, there aren't quite the jobs I was expecting there to be. Um, 
And he talked to his professor and said he was interested in chaos. And his professor was absolutely delighted because he was interested in chaos. And it was the most exciting thing for him to have somebody want to do the same thing. So he spent three years, four years studying chaotic systems, publishing papers about it. He was working with a guy who was doing the sort of programming maths analysis side and he was doing the analog circuitry side of it mm. has published you know multiple papers and books on this subject and then continued in the background doing synth stuff building stuff so he builds these circuits that are are chaotic which is here's explained it it's it's they don't it's not noise which is just purely random sure, yeah it's not completely cyclical like a an LFO or an oscillator just goes through the same path each time, mm. it will repeat round a sort of familiar loop and then might flip into another state. So you might have a an LFO that does one circuit for a while and then flips into another form of stability and then flips back. So he knows so much about this and has this enormous kind of experience and just built and he, he now builds a he designs a circuit a month for these workshops he runs in Perth, in Perth. Uh, where he gets apparently 40 people come. So it's at a big hack space in Perth. And there's just this enormous community has grown up there um, doing DIY, building his designs. Mm. So it's a, it's a you know, really interesting. So what has he learned from chaos? What does he, does he have a good way of like wrangling it? I think make it useful. I think he's he, he it's it becomes a sort of you do see it becomes an obsession with people. They just find there are all these different circuits that do slightly different things. It's completely he's a proper analog purist. Mm. Um just in terms of his own designs. So he none of his designs have any kind of microcontrollers or anything like that in them. Um he's like the uh, Lamont Young of the uh, He's <laughs> he's just completely, you know, he understands this stuff. He is this, you know, kind of professor uh, he is literally Dr. Chaos because he That's has a PhD in chaos. That is incredible. <laughs> um, I studied chaos. Yeah, for four years. Wonderful. <laughs> I suppose it is, though. Yeah, if you've got something on a bench and you're like, this little circuit is doing unexpected things, then that, that is really, it's an analogy for it being alive, you know, or analogous like, to it having a, yeah. a, a life of its own. So the other thing he did, which was... was Really, really interesting. Another thing I saw that he'd done, he did this project called Self, which is like Cell F, where he worked with another guy from the university who was, I guess, some kind of neurologist or something, who has, and I don't know exactly how this bit worked, he has some of his own neurons from his brain, which he grows in a Petri dish. Oh, my God. And they created this enormous, basically, synthesizer installation thing which has live human neurons in a Petri dish. And they, they, the way he describes it, they give it a little bit of glucose at the beginning of the performance oh to kind of wake God. it up. Oh, my God. They then, <laughs> they then stimulate the neurons with um, electrical circuits because they're obviously an electrical thing. Yeah, of course. So he has this whole analog modular thing that is generating the control signals. The neurons respond to that, and his circuits then turn it back into audio. So it's this enormous thing, you know, the size of this this room with all of this analog equipment in it and this Petri dish full of neurons. And they do it and they go on tour. They're going to like Europe next Take year. His brain yeah, to literally us. taking a oh brain in God. a Petri dish to play concerts and they feed a little bit of glucose and off it goes. What do you how do you feel when you think about that? Well, I just it's amazing. I mean, I think it's good. It's good that it's his own neurons. I mean, if it was somebody else's, you might be a bit dubious. Or if it was like you know, like Victorian era, like it was an old convict took like yeah. neurons who has been like hanged or something. It's that kind of thing. But it's not only. It's not far off in a yeah, way. Yeah, I mean, I guess you don't need very many of weird. them. I find that deeply weird and incredibly disturbing. Yeah, and I don't like it. Kill it with fire. <laughs> when you can't kill, fucking going to you kill, can't it, kill it. It's alive. It's like, just like. Sorry, mate, I just literally got to make that decision for you because yeah. what you're doing is not okay. No, it's fine. I mean... <sighs> so you just want, you know, what? what's unfortunate... Does, Nobody's done the Eurorack version yet that you can actually put a little... Ma well, little, but there is that the Eurorack module that's got soil in it. Yeah. There's the soil, like a distortion yeah. that uses earth, which yeah. is like pretty, like, metal. Yeah. But like, well, you could use metal as well. I find yeah. that disturbing, like, but obviously I like uh, aspects of that, like the idea of the feed, you know, but... 
what fr- weirds me out is the idea that his neurons are in a petri dish, so they're they're separate to him. It's like he's yeah. cloned his mind, and it's, <laughs> his mind has been like set adrift and put. To yeah. this, like, do those neurons are they like? Kill are me, they sad? Kill me. Yeah. <laughs> it's trying to, they're trying to find a musical phrase. They're trying to invent a language of music so they can play the phrase "kill me" yeah. through the speakers. Yeah, and after after long enough, they will be able to do that. Yeah, great. <laughs> Fuck, that is deeply disturbing. <laughs> that reminds me a little bit of another thing, which is a lot, lot more pleasant. Which is, I went to um, the Hepworth in Wakefield, where my wife works. My wife, um, and she, um, they had the the sort of Barbara Hepworth like sculpture of the year, sculpture prize of the year, which is like a sort of very nice curate, you know, lots of interesting sculptures, some amazing stuff. Um, and but the sort of musicy one was, um, I cannot think of his name, but a Welsh sculptor who did a. Uh, Basically, beautiful, like, extraordinary object that was, like, um, it was basically an organ pipe driving circuit, which right. was, like, like air pressure well, pipe driver, and then running through all these surgical, like, cables to these um, crystal flutes. Which, oh, wow. Which is made by a company in America who make the, it's the, the crystal the flute, crystal flute co- company. Crystal yeah. flute yeah. company in, like, Massachusetts or whatever, <laughs> like... And they are, and they, they make crystal flutes. And God knows what normal people do with crystal flutes, but the the artist had got, you know, there's probably like 16 or 17 or maybe probably more like 20 or 40 or something. Anyway, but loads of flutes. And then basically you can see that the machine is sort of like on, and then there's an Arduino or something, there's yeah. some kind of microcontroller that just opens the little like valves yeah. and allows air to pass through the flutes. And so... And they've got obviously a very haunting quality, and it's you would have loved it because it's very sort of minimalist and sort of somewhat atonal. Like some very strange, like almost I don't think they are micro tuned, but yeah. very odd chords. Like where the certain amount will keep going, and their harmony is just strange and dissonant um, and sort of spooky. And there's obviously no one in control of it, so it feels like it's got a mind of its own. Yeah. Is because, it outdoors? No, so this is this is indoors. But the the sort of the reason I mention it is because it was powered by, I don't know if it's just the power or if it was being driven by the weir outside the gallery. Okay, so yeah. the, the the weir itself generates power. Yeah, and then the weir delivers its power to the Hepworth Museum. The Hepworth Museum supplies its power to the device. So yeah, and the device is pushing air out into the so. It, it, you know, it was this idea that it was kind of like a lung in the sense yeah, of things. Yeah. It was like breathing in response to the energy source that was feeding it. Um, yeah. I don't know if there's maybe more magic that happened, but actually won the competition. So it yeah. was like, I mean, it was the, the great sculpture, but I thought that was, yeah. it was just one of those nice objects. Like there's, I have talked about this, where there's, um, I went to one in, um, after a super booth, like two years ago, or during super booth, there was a, a Glaswegian artist whose name I've escapes me, but um, she'd done this thing where it was a room full of like speakers, and it was the sound of damaged horns being played. And so there was like wow. the horn that um, the horn that sounded the charge of the light brigade. Right. So she got the horn, and she got a, a player to play the horn as well yeah. as it can be played. And that's obviously cracked and broken yeah, and bent. Yeah. And so she recorded those and then plays those sounds, I don't know if algorithmically or something, yeah. she plays them into the space. So you've got the sound of like tortured war instruments being played, which <laughs> also very spooky, but like really nice. Um, it is amazing how many people there are doing this kind of stuff. Weird, so weird that, music stuff. There's the, I don't, I don't know much about it. There's a, a channel, I guess it's on Facebook and Instagram stuff called POW Academy. I don't know if you've ever seen this. POW. POW. Um, and it seems to be just this network of people and it ranges from quite straightforward, you know, here is my modular, here is my patch, to just really interesting people doing that stuff. And they seem Ooh. to have kind of, you know, chapters all over the world where people are just collecting and curating this stuff. Uh, and just, it is endless. You know, there's practice. Just, just you know, people, yeah, just people making really interesting, you know, thought-provoking quirky stuff mm. with you know using sound somewhere in it yeah there was um i was talking to a friend of mine who had the older shot synth meet the other night oh, yeah. in, in older shot another great great synth hookup but there was apparently there was a there was a woman who came to that who was doing stuff with just pure data um, yeah. and actually i was talking to one of the guys at anderton's before he's like yeah it's tonight and there's this lady's coming down she's got this like 
synth, like this this pure data thing. It's supposed to be amazing. And then I talked to my friend Tom separately afterwards. He was like, there was this woman there. She had this like pure data yeah. thing. It was amazing. And it was like, I think as far as history could relate, it was basically like she'd just been creating her own pure data patch inspired by Orteca. Yeah. Um, and she's saying whenever she was trying to, she was explaining things and they were like, well, so how does that section work? And she would double click it and it would just, it would explode within explosions, Opening, yeah, within explosions, yeah. within explosions. And everyone was yeah. like, you know, it was like 2001 <laughs> at the end, you know, it's just like, we've come into this conversation very late. You yeah. Know, like you've, you've been very busy. Um, and yeah, and, I, and he was like, I can't find anything about her on the internet. And I was like, yeah, I want to know who she is. I want to hear what she did. I want to talk to her because I'm tr I'm really curious about how you, how do you build computer systems to like do music as it ought yeah. to do, like pure data FM groove boxes. Yeah. It's like inspired by the NTS thing this year. Yeah. It's like, yeah. I want to, I want to know more about that. How the hell do you actually do it? Because the problem with modulars is they're just too expensive to well, you do, do you? have that limit. You can't say, give me, you know, 96 sine waves no, no. and have them all doing this thing because that would be expensive and difficult. Yeah. And the sort of the kind of feedback or like, you know, interrelationships, I think you can be a much more deeper and meaningful if they're done through a computer. You have more control over them. You can, I don't know, interconnect things more easily, perhaps, or not. Yeah. I don't know. Like, yeah, I think it's, like, and it's, it's, it's obviously much less immediate, but it's got that there's definitely something hmm. about that you know just being able to control it i mean i did it after, after that lamont young thing last year put out you know just you start playing with pure, pure data and start you Have know, you messed with it? settings yeah setting sign so i did a thing this year which was just literally from playing that and saying you know if we if you set off i think i did it with like 32 sine waves and you set them off at particular frequencies and then you say okay move to other frequencies over an hour or whatever um and you know just having that level of control to just say you know off you go let's listen and it's i remember listening to somebody talking about the difference between experimental music and non-experimental music and their definition was experimental music is when you don't know what the outcome is going to be okay yeah. so you literally are saying i can set up this system and I can embark on it. And it might be that you're playing it yourself or whatever, mm. but you don't actually know what the outcome's going to be. And that's exactly like this. You say, what would it sound like to have 32 mm. sine waves doing that? It's an experiment. Um, and you set it, it off and you, you see what it sounds like. Yeah. Um, and it's very different from that, you know, having a, a specific goal in mind, which is normal music, I think. Mm. Mm. And a lot of things that people describe as experimental music aren't that. You know, there's something else. They're, they're, they're trying yeah, to create it's, something it's that's It's a byword for this difficult to listen yeah, to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's difficult to create, necessarily. Yeah. Which Unfortunately, a lot of difficult to listen to music is very easy to create. <laughs> yes, yeah. In fact, well, I mean, it was the easiest, yeah. I would say. And actually, this was, you know, this is... But it, it's, it was quite an interesting thing to do because you got... It's on it's on Bandcamp and it's... You, you, Do you charge you like if you've done like one copy like Wu Tang Clan and it's actually a million pounds? No, it, it isn't. You should it do costs, that. costs like a Add quid, that. and I think I've sold about four of them. But okay. it's, it's um, it's I think they're spread across stereo, and it's all about the the interrelationships with them. So mm. they, they they will all be having some kind of interaction at the beginning, and then as it moves, you just get lots of phasing patterns yeah. coming in, and it 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 is, it is quite it does does do your head in. I mean, I, I was going to say, do you feel sick when you listen well, to certain apes? I, I don't, but I remember, I remember playing it to my, playing it to my wife, just put it up on headphones on her ears. And she was just like, Oh, it feels like it's tickling me inside. <laughs> like not in a good way. Not in a you good know, way. He was like, I could see somebody might like that, but I really don't. Yeah. And it, and it, the, the piece that's up on, on, um, on Bandcamp is, I think it's 50 minutes long because it's based on the limits of, track lengths on Bandcamp. Yes, yes. And I so it spends it starts at a particular point and then spends twenty five minutes rising and then twenty five minutes settling back down. Mm. And there's one version that's sine waves, it's obviously very kind of womb like and kind of warm. And then there's another version that's square waves. Ooh, which is raw much sweat more, no filter. Yeah, much more no of, I think it's got a little tiny bit of filter on it because it was so noisy but it was it's it's again it's interesting you, you do get a really interesting the interrelationship is the same mm. and you get far more obviously harmonics going up and down with it 
but you know, I, I can highly recommend it as your your Christmas listening. Yeah, yeah, no, well, I'm gonna put that on at Christmas actually. Yeah. Sod the carols. So. Yeah, just put it on loudly with Christmas dinner and see if anyone's actually physically. Well, sick. when family Christmas, uh, you know, there's a theme is sparkles. You have to wear sparkles, but everyone's got to do a turn. Yeah. And so I was thinking, I was thinking about what would my turn be, and I mean, I would quite like. I thought genuinely as I was walking over here that I might try and do like a techno uh, Christmas song. <laughs> Um, and just sort of get my modular out and sort of yeah. diligently set everything up. Yeah, <laughs> just, sort of, set. just go, just yeah. do a set. And also, but that, have some like I need to like feed the sort of like you know the the melodies of like famous Christmas songs into my modular and into like marbles or something. You could just read. load up a whole load of Christmas albums into radio music. and yes. just have them crisscrossing. Oh, that's a lot easier. So it would be Let's it would be that. like it's that Stockhausen piece. The Stockhausen piece, which he does with. Um, uh, national anthems. It's not really just like where it's just it. loads of like weird right, through, national right. anthem stuff, you know, and reverb. And yeah, that. just do that. Say I, this is my Stockhausen Christmas. <laughs> it's a durational piece. It lasts yeah. about two and a half hours. But... Yeah, two and a half hours. If you yeah. if you were to play that with my uh, phase sine wave stuff beneath it, I yeah, think yeah. That, would, that would be a useful I foundation. Would like for your every, practice. Every family member to leave the room at one point. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. All right, well, yeah. I'll do that. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yes, it's, yeah, I, I like the idea of messing around with pure data, but I just feel like it's, is it hard to get to grips with? Is it actually like a, a dick no, to, it's like, pretty, well, pick up? No, I, f I found it pretty straightforward. It's, is it, is it gra it's, it's all graphic, and it's, it's all, typing. so it's all, you, you have this weird thing where you, you basically type, and the graphic elements pop up. So you kind of click, and you get a little text box, and you type in, like, squiggle osc 440 or something and then up comes a little element that is your oscillator and then you can plug that into an output and you put it into other things and the thing you're describing with going in and in is you can then create kind of an abstraction yes. so you say okay i'm going to make like I've, I've done stuff with it with delays where you you just create like a whole mass of delays feeding back into each other and then you kind of encapsulate that and then you drop six of them on yeah. <laughs> and you've just got this incredibly complicated system <laughs> So you do get this kind of yeah things within things within things yeah, within yeah. things, and it, it yeah I mean it's and it sounds very nice you know it's obviously very very kind of clear and you yeah. know computery, um, but it and it some of it's it's not it's reasonably sort of low level so you won't normally have like show me a delay with a feedback, you'll have you'll have a box that will store the signal for you know two seconds or whatever mm. and then you need to connect that to a mixer and you connect that to something in it's to create literal. the feedback yeah, and that actually. stuff and you can start to create interfaces and sort of pull things out and you can and, you know it, it it's really really flexible mm. i mean i suppose it's like it's it's the same origin as max msp yeah so it's the same sort of like, same yeah, guy. but it's free isn't it yeah it's free it's completely open source free? free it's like amazing i don't know i think i think um I think the guy whose name I can't remember who created was one of the people who created Max. Then I think went and did Pure Data as oh, a okay. separate project afterwards. Um, Does it? You can hook up MIDI controllers specifically. Yeah, you do. I mean, you can, you can do, do anything, anything with it. Anything, you know, yeah. it's and it, it's one of those things that has endless kind of weird libraries that you can plug into it. Mm. But it is quite. You know, I think if you're doing MIDI stuff with it, it's quite straightforward. It's you know, is it you better can... to use Max MSP though? You think? So I've, I've never got, used I've got Live Ten, so I've, I think I've got. I I've... think I've got Max MSP. I've like, never yeah. used Max MSP, so yeah. I don't know. Mm. So that reminds me of the the other thing I did this year with this John Chowning talk. Oh my Christ! So this you was this no Chowning, get Chowning. <laughs> yeah. So this is my. Um... Oh, tell me you got it signed. You fucking bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Like when you, when I saw that you were at that, I was like, a I didn't know that he was even playing, and b yeah. that's frustrating because I live in Yorkshire now, and it was in like Queen Mary's University because I would have dragged my DX7 down, and yeah. I, I would get him to sign my DX7. That's like getting Bob Moog to sign your Mini Moog. It's like, so it was it wasn't the thing the thing reminded me of it. John Chat. He, so he did this talk. That's that's cool. And Folks, that's what cool looks like. <laughs> he was absolutely fascinating because he he was a. I hadn't really realised that he was a musician. He was fundamentally a musician. Yeah. He was a. Uh, uh, I think he was maybe a percussionist or something. He was telling 
and he was he was telling these stories there about how so when, he's in the, <laughs> when he was in the in the orchestra, you know, he whatever he was playing, he didn't have to do very often. So he had a lot of gaps. He's so it's bored. A, something like he has a lot of time yeah, to think literally about. Like that, something like he was playing the tuba or something, and then it wasn't something. And so yeah. he would then chat to the kettle drum guy, who also didn't, about didn't do very much. And exactly, they would just talk about stuff, and he he learnt about. Um, computer music that Max Matthews was was beginning yeah. to do, and he went to I guess Stanford, and it was talking. He was really interesting talking about how universities are amazing for that sort of thing for just being able to, if you've got a question, there's always somebody you can find who knows yeah. about it and is able to solve it. And obviously he was when they were doing this, this was all, you know, punch card programming. Yeah, and, this stuff. and he yeah he basically came up with what we know as. FM and he he his his talk was great and I think he said his talk was constructed in Max MSP. Really? <laughs> he was using it as a kind of presentation That's incredible. system, <laughs> or it may just there was lots of kind of audio visual demonstrations there. But he had a fantastic bit where he just showed, you know, this is a a whatever one hertz um, FM which is just like vibrato, mm. and then he gets higher and higher and it just sounds sort of a bit weird and then suddenly he's like and then you try it with whatever it is a kilohertz against the kilohertz and suddenly you get this weird different noise Ooh. that appears um and him going from that really kind of theoretical you know learning experimental stuff, truly to then the there's a kind of um university kind of partnerships office or something he mentions it to them and they go well is this is there anything useful in this and he says, you know, I think you'd be able to create quite interesting musical sounds with it. They go around all of the American organ manufacturers mm. and say, we've made this thing. And they just have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. They're just confused. And then finally they get to Yamaha, which at the time was the biggest organ manufacturer in the world. And they go, yes, we think there is something here. Uh, and he's patented it and they license it and there apparently now is an enormous you know building at Stanford that is paid for and funded by all of the royalties that came back from mm. Yamaha doing that yeah it's mad like and we were talking about this just before we started but like the thing to check out is those Dave did you say you watched them the Dave Bristow yeah they're amazing like, yeah. that's so it's meant, like filled me with joy like so this is like Dave Bristow, who is one of the programmers, him and another guy, and obviously there were probably yeah. other folks too, programming the 32 patches that were delivered on yeah. the original DX7 and him talking about like the sort of the you know, being in Yamaha at that time and what actually that experience was like yeah. and then being told by like the board that like with a week to go, they wanted another 128 yeah. patches or something <laughs> because they were like, we're going to give car we're going to give these little cassettes or yeah. like cartridges that will have sounds. So we need more sounds. Yeah. And he said that he was like, yeah, we were, it was three o'clock in the morning and we had like a bottle of Suntory whiskey and we were in like this sort of in, you know, Yamaha that, know Japan. another marimba. Yeah. It's just like, <laughs> but he said, what I liked is the bit where he said, cause they, they literally were just like, they have a checklist and they were like, all the instruments of the orchestra. Yeah. Well, we've got to do all of those. So they did all of those. Yeah. And they're like, well, guitar, you know, piano, electric piano. And then, but then what I thought was cool is he was like, there was a point where we just sort of went a bit mad. Yeah. And we started to think about sounds that only it could make. Yeah. Well. And that's why I was like, yes, mate. Like, yeah. that's the point of a synth, you know? And it's like, I was playing with the, this sort of bit of a name drop. Yeah, I was playing with the Moog One the other day. <laughs> and, like, there is actually some really good, like, Rhodes piano sounds that the, yeah. Rhodes, the Moog One can do, like, a very good synthesis of the of the Rhodes piano. Yeah. I think there's one which I th definitely think is done by SDG Sound Labs because it's presets called Cool Piano Dude, which is, like, <laughs> which I've seen him wearing a T-shirt. It's yeah. just, like, Cool Piano Dude with, like, a mini Moog. Yeah. Um, and it sounds really good. And it's, like, you sort of forget that was obviously the purpose of... And that's why... You know, when you play the DX7, like, I mean, if you're like me, you think about it in historical context, and you're like, it, like, I do, I completely understand why people just fucking threw their analog synths yeah. in the street. Yeah. Because, as, you know, for the purpose of being a real instrument, they are terrible. Yeah. Like, and the DX7 is like, is super, like, it sounds incredible, like, yeah. relatively, like, and it's polyphonic. It's just, like, obviously a better and musical device. it's easy and it's carryable and it's a, it's a simple, advocate. yeah, it's a simple... And I mean, the thing I I found having one to play with was just the... the how 
just how amazingly simple the basic core of it is. When you listen mm. to the crazy things that it can do, and you realize it is literally just seven sine waves and yeah. feedback. That's, that's it. It's just and amazing. Envelopes. You know, it's it's almost simpler than you know than a than an analog synth. Yeah, I mean, it's just completely pure what it's doing, and it does. It's that's just why like, it sounds. All so it is is an, is a sine wave oscillator and volume controls. Yeah, yeah. and a mixer and a mixer and feedback. a lot of mixer. Yeah, it's a and a lot of mixer. Yeah. That's three. That's all yeah. it is, and then it's just how you make those oscillators interact yeah. with each other. To, on a and I found basis. I that's found it. the interface as well really interesting. How when you see these where well, you've got the big programmers I, I am going to put a jumper on you right but it's you've, december damn it you've got the big programmers but or you've got like the software ones where you have like loads and loads of knobs actually i found programming it through the real interface you can see they really have thought it through you know there's a lot of stuff there I mean, they tried to make it as simple as yeah well thing. there's lots of things that do really make sense this kind of you know things like you can copy the um, envelopes all across the different oscillators by literally just holding it and going mm. tapping it across yeah. and the once you sort of get into it and start playing with it you can make it do interesting things the the way the actual factory sounds a program is just completely incomprehensible and i can't imagine, imagine how they would construct yeah i can't kind of conceive of how you would sit there and programming it and make it sound like a like we were just playing earlier it can do speech things you know you make it press yeah, a you button. had a sound that was speak one can yeah you, wait, it says is this, is this <laughs> wait well, that's four that was four yeah. so the idea of doing that is that is absolutely amazing there's a, there's a try this one hold that down put it in the middle hold it down holding down d yeah that's fine that'll do it it's a kettle boiling. Oh my fucking god. <laughs> They've even got the quiveriness yeah. of it. It's like just it is quivering. <laughs> yeah, I think that was like the end of the night. Like all the Centauri was gone then. But the thing I the thing I realized playing with it is is you um to basically make Brian Eno sounds, you take the standard factory ones. And then you turn up all the attack and decay on all, all the envelopes. So, so it's a big long pad. Yeah. And then you run it through even tied reverbs. Yeah. And it's just amazing. All I, like, Guys obviously genius. Yeah, yeah, no, right. <laughs> all I want to do with the DX7 is make pads quite I like yeah. I'm fairness it's like my my other FM love this year has been like the the slap bass sound. <laughs> like I really like if you really spend some time, like that's a sound that's like so cheesy and shit. Yeah. But if you just go for it and program like an acid bass line, yeah. it sounds fucking cool. It's just like, because it's not what, if, well, I say it's not what everyone's doing. It's like what a number of people are doing. But like, yeah. I think that's a cool, like it's a good use of the sound. Yeah. But um, pads, like pads on FM synths, like there is yeah. no better pad machine yeah. than an FM, like a GX7, I yeah. think. Like it's, and it's what maybe I would say maybe with a slight like hesitation, maybe like the DX one hundred, where you've got the grittier, cheaper, rougher yeah. end, where they were you know trying to bring the cost down, the yeah. lower quality DAX or however it works, you know. So yeah. they have this like rough grit, like the DX twenty one, yeah, you know, because yeah. they were all by that time system on a chip type things, which what's the thing, so, yeah. yeah. you know, the Chemi's castle yeah. and stuff, and it's I like this, I like the dirtiness of them, yeah. um, and I've got a real soft spot for the kind of dirtier cheaper end of synthesis the forgotten end yeah. of the 80s where it was like where the dx7 had lost its you know and everyone was like making analog the people who were still making analog synths were making them look like the dx7 which is just yeah. like laughable yeah well they couldn't you know because the most expensive part of it's going to be all the knobs and the switches and the pots i suppose that makes that, sense they they were able to just put the whole thing you know put in a microprocessor and mm. then then you really lose everything if you've got no interface and you've yeah. got not an especially interesting sound. You look at look at the ads and it's all like, it's got computer control. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like computer was the word, like, yeah. oh, it's got a computer in it. Like, perfect. Yeah. So I was going to ask you a question. Um, we haven't really sort of, we've sort of just been talking about <laughs> but that's fine. Um, 40 minutes <laughs> has passed. Um, because obviously this is like, this is an auspicious occasion that this is, this marks a year of the podcast almost, yeah. or give or take. Um 
and like it's quite I think it's quite nice to like look at the year like yeah. do you not think that, that I mean I mean 2018 has obviously had some ups and downs that's for damn sure yeah um, but we're older and wiser people than we were when we, <laughs> when we sat in this room a year ago um, you know are we do you think we're any wiser is that <laughs> I don't know I think I think it's a it's you know it, it is constantly sort of changing and I think it's that in terms of the the sort of it feels like that sort of Eurorack modular scene is still growing spectacularly. I still keep meeting new people who are saying, "Oh, I'm just interested in getting into this." Yeah, that's um, definitely the case. And I think that's you know fundamentally is a really good thing. You know, you look at things like all the kind of Behringer stuff this year, which the Clone you, Wars. Yeah, which <laughs> I've I, got a little subheading. I feel really Wars. sort of you know was that ha- that hadn't happened when we talked before, had it? Like, I think we must have must maybe it was before Super Booth. Yeah, so it was, it was when it really we kicked off as a January, single booth. Basically. Yeah, um, and I when I was doing music thing the blog, I think twenty, probably two thousand and six, two thousand and seven, maybe. I did music an April Fool, yeah, 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 which yeah. was, you know, Behringer are releasing a mini Moog and a synthy, and they're going to be like one hundred and ninety nine quid, and it <laughs> li- has literally has come true. absolutely entirely come true, <laughs> and I sort of. Look at it. Because well, we did talk about this, because at the end did, yeah. of the podcast, you were like, you know, that's... I think you were basically saying, you know, it's a good and righteous thing, or it's 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 the, I way, think that's it. I the think... way of the way it will be, that yeah. there will be people who will exploit their kind of manufacturing power to do yeah. things at a price. You know, my sort of emotional reaction to it is to just get really annoyed. But that is purely a kind of emotional reaction. And I think, actually, there cannot be anything possibly in any way negative about a lot more people having access to stuff and Behringer's yeah. history of all they've done is is democratizing this yeah. stuff and so I mean, it's, it's a kind of there's definitely a little head I mean you can argue thing. that because but hang on you've got a TR08 which is a 350 pound yeah, exactly it's just but it's not there's, there's it you know Behringer do it because it's analog on full size and so they're able to say well ha, that's what everyone wants you know but yeah. I think that there is it's a funny one with Roland that they clearly just refuse to actually remake a product in the old way. They must innovate it in some way. I yeah. think that's that is what's happening in the board meetings. Yeah, is that there is like there is just they absolutely cannot just do the same thing again. Yeah, because you are just rehash. You know, where's the originality? Where's the creativity in rehashing the old thing? I mean, obviously, the ironic. You know, obviously, people want to have the old thing to be creative with it. It's just that idea of like it's it isn't a creative act to just remake your no. own thing and to to change it like we called with the MS twenties they made it small you know? yes <laughs> but, yeah but I think I mean I put like a lot of people are like you know are like it's so stupid it's so small why not just make it full size well as you say it makes it more expensive yeah because it is like the chassis like with Euro yeah. modules the most expensive element is the yeah. panel yeah like quite often. Um, but I, yeah, I, don't, I, I lived in London flats for yeah. ages. I really, really appreciate it being twenty percent. Yeah, and I mean, for me, that the TR eight, I don't think I would want a full size one. You know, no. I think I'm quite happy to have it that size because it's a really nice. You wouldn't little be able to fit it on your desk. No. Yeah. So I think I think, <laughs> but I, I I think it's a the fundamental thing has to be it's bringing people in and it's and it's making it so much easier to get into this world and seeing. You know, seeing people hacking this stuff, seeing people taking yeah. their Volkers and and adding MIDI outputs to them, and and you know, making them do things they weren't intended to do. Has, you can take those kinds of risks. Yeah, no, yeah. that's that's totally true. Like you'll um, take risks with something because yeah. it doesn't cost so much money. Like which you never do on a two thousand pound anyway. Yeah, mm. you, you don't want to suggest that that shouldn't exist. Yeah, and you don't want to suggest really that should people shouldn't buy well, it. Because arguably, it's the same thing as well. Why does you know? Cubase looked like wait, Cubase looked like Cubase know, was the original. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well like yeah. do you know what I mean? Like all the way that all the like DAWs, yeah, with the exception of like things like Ableton Live and yeah. like Reason, they all have a they all look the same, they work the yeah. same way. Same was with with analog subtractive synths. You know, yeah. Minimo had pitch and mod wheels. It was yeah. the first one to do so. And then people just took yeah. that idea and just pushed and, it around. So that's that's uh, been going on for a hundred years. Well, and Art years. had to change the designs of their stuff because they got sued by Moog for, for ripping off the, the filters. filters. So it's, yeah. it does, you know, go and come around. But I think that's what I meant. It's, it's good. It is good that it exists and it's good that it brings people into the scene. It's ironic, isn't it, that the 
the, the three stages of the Odyssey filter are represented in like the Korg reissue and that the Behringer clones also clone that, you know, yeah. idea too. Like, because it's got the three, you know, with yeah. one of them being the, the, the yes, like, it's an interesting coincidence that that's happened. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But it's just funny they're knocking off the thing that they knocked off, the thing that was knocked off. Yeah. It was, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it, yeah, I just don't feel, I, but I think to their credit, I think, you know, with the 808, you know, 909, Roland have had the opportunity to make an analog 808 that yeah. is full size and have chosen not to do that and they've shown their cards. Yeah. You know, whereas if Behringer were to make a, a small, uh, like, ARP 2600 now, I think it's entirely possible that's something that Korg are developing. Like, if you've done the Odyssey, yeah. you should do the 2600 because it's not that different, like, yeah. in terms of what it actually, circuitry-wise, it's just the big panel and, yeah. and the patch points. So, but, like, yeah... I don't know. But I just don't feel good about the Odyssey. But I think the 808, 909, they're a fair game. Everyone else has been cloning them. There's loads of other clones. Yeah. It's not just, you know, Behringer. But it's just, it's such a shame, like, as you say, like, the, they can do, like, a Neutron. Why not do other original things? Or, or do things that are, like, you know, you could almost have something that is more expensive, but it's, like, pushing the envelope of what's possible. Well, equally, they would, they would say their polysynth they started with yeah. would, would be... To a degree. That, you know, is, they, yeah, that, that was is. a you know reasonably original design and that yeah. was was what they were doing and actually the frustration is people do want this stuff you know like yeah. if you look at the history of um uh gibson guitars they have always tried to do things that are original and experiment experimental and mm. everyone has always hated it from the beginning <laughs> to end you know they hired hired bob moog to design the circuitry in their guitars you know they did all this weird experimentation with active circuits they've done all kinds of weird designs. They made these like Les Pauls with robotic self-tuning oh, yeah, yeah, machine yeah, yeah, yeah. heads yeah, and all this kind that. of stuff. Yeah. And you know, everyone hates it. They're <laughs> laughing <laughs> stuff. Like, I want the and old thing. Fender make Fenders from 1950s designs in different colours, and they optimize them and improve them very gently. They will, you know, make a slightly different type of bridge, or they will make the tremolo a bit more reliable and they will upgrade the pickups mm. and everyone's happy with them and they seem to be financially doing better yeah, yeah, yeah. you know gibson go Gibson's bankrupt the, every yeah, few it's years it, well it's in well it's bankrupt now it's yeah it's been sold. yeah so i think it's yeah. you know i it, it, it's hard to be too you know judgmental and critical with these things because yeah. i think i think it's also about you know people have to create the company that they want to be so moog seems to be a really positive, interesting, good, you know, com yeah. employee-owned company. I, visit, I went to Moog and I can 1,000% corroborate that to be true. Like, yeah. They are, it's like the nicest vibe. It's yeah. like Willy Wonka. We were there with like a bunch of like UK dealers um, and I like shout out to, to <laughs> I was there with Dan from GAC who is like a Moog fan and I was, I just turned to him and we were walking around and I was like, you're right, Dan. And he's like, and he just said, I could go at any moment. He was just, he was ready to like start weeping openly <laughs> to be in that place was like he was he was emotionally moved yeah. to be there like you know and it is it, it was so nice like and so Mo could make three hundred quid mini Mo clone mm. in China if they wanted to it's not a difficult thing well that was the, there was that email that was sent I don't know if there's any further upshot from that right. but, but but they did send an email about the trade tariffs thing saying how you know Trump, yes, how Trump's sort of yeah. like yeah could could make US yeah. manufacturer manufacturing financially yeah. unviable I mean there's lots of weird stuff going on with with electronics you know that I'm not that close to but things like the costs of literally resistors and capacitors mm. are changing, particularly, uh, particularly um, capacitors, have suddenly become massively more expensive and massively rare over the really? last couple of years. I mean, oh. not not massively, but these are things which but, would have cost would have cost you know a penny, and now might cost ten p, which oh, is wow. a pretty significant That's change when you're doing expensive. it. That sort of thing, and Could and you you'll just got... find like if you look at look at um, uh, the sort of builds a material for things that I design, or if you probably, I imagine if you look at mutable instruments ones where they're all public, yeah. Uh, you, I suspect if you look at it, you'll find all of the capacitors are now out of stock, and you have to replace them with another, oh, okay. another, yeah, another, another one, which you, which you have to do over time anyway, because they're very, they're, they're kind of commodity things. 
Um, and then normally I think you'll have somebody in the company whose job is to manage that kind of stuff. But the the prices of them have gone up really significantly. There's been a kind of, and I don't, I don't, Why is that? I don't know. Especially building what's these things out of raw materials. So like, I don't know what a capacitor factory looks like, but I imagine that would be quite. A big I imagine you'd be interested to go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I would be interested to go. Well, that is that one of these fascinating. To see. I had an interesting somebody. Somebody was doing a doing their PhD, and they asked me they what they were talking about um, modular synthesis in this, and they said they wanted to write a line about um, why analog is different from digital, uh, and they had written something. They said, "Can you just?" look at this and tell me if this is right. And it was really interesting to sit and think, what is the actual answer to this? Well, truly know, what makes that. analog different? How do you mean? Well, so, so they, they had said, you know, um, uh, they'd said it, for example, it's the temperature change. So if you've got a, an analog oscillator, the change in temperatures will change how it responds. Mm. And a lot of the design is trying to stop that from happening. Yeah. Whereas if you've got digital oscillator, it will not make any difference because it's, yeah. it's numbers. Um, and when you start looking at why that is, it is because these are, you know, earth materials. You know, they're ceramics. They're things dug out of the ground mm. um, and refined. And and actually, I think the way a lot of them is done is they almost just they churn them out and then test them. And then you're buying the ones that are tested within these specific specifications. So the difference between a... Because of course there's percent. Uh, yeah, the difference between a 1% resistor and a 10% resistor, they, as I understand it, they're all made in the same line. They just check the ones that are tolerant and they charge extra for those ones. They don't mix different Oh, they don't do... Together. Oh, wow. That's, that, as I understand it, and there may well be somebody listening to this who understands a lot better than me, yeah, but so that's... How, that's how do I'm, they make... I mean, capacitors, well, actually, they're like two little bits of metal close to each other. Well, that's the metal ones of that. And, uh, but I think the ceramic ones, I don't know exactly how. I don't know what's it's inside like, them at just, all. If you actually open up this little elm, yes. <laughs> holding electrons, like looking back at you like, yeah. what? And I mean, they are like obviously so so comically small when you get into them. Oh, mate, so I'm just this. opening. A, this is what's brilliant about the surface mount stuff. So where we are, you see, we're, we're surrounded by like boxes of, the normal big components. Yeah. Oh, but when got, you get into... You've got a box that literally says big, big bits. bits. <laughs> got switch. Cool. When you get into this stuff, you get like... So oh my, oh my God. So He's go. holding a pair of tweezers. Here's your, here's your Christmas present. Let's put your hand Thanks, up. Tom. There's a, there's a 2K resistor for you. It's the dude from Inner Space. He's <laughs> <laughs> sort of like Randy Quaid or whatever. He's like in his little ship. And you just... What is that? That's, so that's a resistor. And is this like, there's, there's different scales of SMD. So that is a 603, which is, and then here, hang on, I'll give you, give you a bigger fella here. You can have, you can take these away with you. Oh, thanks. So that's a 603, which is... Um, I just don't breathe, that's all. Which is kind doing. of what the... Oh, that's positively enormous in comparison. Yeah, so the 1206 is the sort of biggest ordinary... So basically box. surface mount, yeah, I mean, it, it is like, it's like a little car. It looks like a little box. And basically it's a part that's so small yeah. that it can be put on by a machine and you can have a very tiny object like an Apple Watch that yeah. contains and then there's a chip. all the parts. What's the smallest size that you get? Is so it, you get, they get really, really small. So the, there must be a point where you can... So that's a chip, which is a lot bigger. Oh, yeah, yeah. But the, um, I'll keep that because those are expensive. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so you get... I definitely, I'm not... I'm not I mean, just put them on top because I, I, you, you throw them away once you've taken them out. Uh, uh, my get, favorite, get confused with them. My favorite thing that um, Justin from Abstract Data told me about was how he was doing some like surface mount soldering, um, and like burned his hand and went, Ugh! and <laughs> accidentally <laughs> ate a yeah. component. So I think it probably happens more often than you think. Like, yeah, you find components in beards. You and do just they, and they, that. you definitely once you've taken it out, you don't want to use it because you'll just get confused. But yeah. so the six hundred three is what the that's really friggin' the small kind of um, uh, mutable stuff would be. What this like the tiny, tiny, tiny one? Yeah, that's I think that's normal mutables will have that on it. And then but um, people make these. Oh no! But when I say people make them by themselves, they make versions that are scaled up. No, I I use those by hand. So, that's so hardcore. So that's <laughs> like that's all done by hand by me. And the way I do those is artisanal. Is, yeah, that's definitely organic, artisanal. made in Herne Hill. So it's it's um. It does actually say. It, it you does say in Herne Hill. Are you very proud of yeah. Herne Hill. Well, no, it's just where I'm from. <laughs> 
There's one that was designed in... Um, Have you acknowledged that it was not, not Herne Hill? Please think, don't judge it. I think this one... That was designed in Cornwall. Because I was on holiday that week. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> And what's this? Oh, this is the vaults. Yeah, vaults, vaults was designed in yeah. Cornwall because it was very, very, very simple to do. That was it was designed it was voltages. I think so you probably wanted to say Port Scatho, but you yeah. just go around onto the other side to fit it in. <laughs> right, so I went well, mate. But then, yeah, you do get. So then, I think now, uh, I think Olivier is probably using the next size down, which is O four O two, which is really pretty. Really, yeah, that's machine. I think the um, machine does I think that. the ears has got O four O two on it. But I think in your, I think they do go further down. I think in your phone you'll have yeah, just smaller like and smaller Apple ones. ones. Yeah. Have, yeah. Let's talk about this. Yes. This this is um, I'm just like picking things off Tom's desk <laughs> that I find interesting. So this is a Manaquins module. Yeah. Is it Manaquins? Is the name of the company? Yeah. Well, I kind of slag off Manaquins a lot, and I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about that now because right. I've never done. I just kind of say I don't understand their modules, but I'm going to the on a rant because this is. Like, I think in like. Marketing is fine and marketing is important, but yeah. I, I feel a strong portion of marketing is in clearly communicating the benefits of your product to help users discover what you do and musically benefit from your yeah. ideas. And I think clear communication is an essential component in that. Yeah. With that said, I like poetry. I like poems. Um, and the, I'm in, there's the manual. And I'm into it. <laughs> um, his manuals generally i think uh is that for w or is, is that this a scroll <laughs> yeah it is a scroll yeah <laughs> this is a scroll and i mean what i do like is like the module itself has got like it's... little dinosaurs and a scene that's built out of pcbs and his stuff is apparently really really cool so this it's, module everyone is like it's amazing the problem is that the stuff he writes on his website for anyone who's listening who's not seen it is what i describe as you, accurately you've got examples of it as there. A sixth form poetry history navigator Connecting patch shapes in temporal arrangements. Music, comma, is sounds, comma, are vibrations, comma, as waves, comma, of energy. One can wait all day for the perfect wave, though it may never come. In these ebbing moments we live inside of memories gone past. These tiny histories aren't meant for books. Nothing but personal fragments. Instead we capture these energetic wavings within wa forward slash. So... I I don't I, I don't know what that does. So That's I don't entirely detail. agree with you. So this is this is a really really interesting module because it's the way it's designed is absolutely remarkable. If you look at it, yeah, you can see it's got it's, it's, it's a there's nothing else like it designed quite like it. It's a sandwich of circuit boards. The front panel, so a normal Eurorack front panel is a single sheet of aluminium. It looks like a this has shape. a sheet of as far as I understand, it's got a sheet of steel for strength. It's then got, I think, in there something, some like layer of um, maybe acrylic, very thin, to um, uh, to break up the light. What's the word I'm looking for? To diffuse the light. I'm not certain, but it might do. And then it's got a very thin layer of aluminium on top for the for the finish. It's got the LEDs that shine off the circuit board directly up through the panel. Uh, oh, so the panel itself is kind so of the panels translucent. Like light, yeah, so it has come, it. light coming, coming through it. Yeah, wow. Uh, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, it sounds great. So it's basically like a tape loop mm. sort of thing. So it's got really nice um, sound. Like it, it does uh, speeding up and slowing down tape, like very slightly. You'll just tweak it, Whoop. and it will just do the all those little things beautifully. Yeah. However, it does have the interface of it is, I think, very problematic. So the <laughs> interface for what is a really, really complicated module is three push buttons, one switch that can go up and down, and four, well, one audio output, one audio input, and then two, which are either outputs or inputs, depending on how it's configured. Okay, wow. Uh, and it is... I have spent some time with it and found it very, very frustrating so to you try and get it to do anything. It would first say you have not enjoyed your... No, so it's, it's been but really... But do you think it could be made better if it had better documentation? I mean, first... No, I I think, no the there, is, there is tons of documentation. And, and actually, they're very, you know, they're very good on the communities that are discussing it. Um, 
you know, there the the questions are there and are answered. Um, but I think I think his other modules I really enjoy. So I've mm. got I've got um, uh, Mangrove, which is the oscillator. You've got this one, which isn't plugged into any moment, but yeah, well, wow. that so that's that is another very mysterious one. Cold Mac called Cold Mac, which like um, and cheese. Yeah, that's got those little parts in it. Yes, so that that is it's a really busy backpack. that is like a voltage processor. So it's taking voltages in and just mixing them, wave folding them, uh, flipping them. Oh, right. So it's quite a you know it's a, it, it, that is definitely a difficult module to learn, and it's explained in a pretty straightforward way. He will use funny words for things, mm. so he won't use technical engineering terms for things yes. so he won't say this is an offset he'll say this is a survey control and you can say okay you should use the standard offset you know technical language um i wouldn't necessarily yeah i think it's good to use like language that isn't technical yeah. because we mustn't make assumptions on people's knowledge but i think there is a way of explaining things that is non-technical that is clear yeah it's like I but, mean, but by being poetic that's one thing and i think it's fine I'm I'm just being a dick because it <laughs> because I, I to me it's the antithesis of of like what's the even word like it's just like if you design a product like help people understand it I know yeah it will it will enrich the experience like you're having a negative experience with this no I'm having a negative you experience to do with the interface because of not the interface the I I you know so, I I quite strongly disagree with the interface decisions he has made there <laughs> uh, and I I I will not I'm not interested in defending those interface decisions. But I think I think it's a it's a it's a kind of an easy thing to say is he should be explaining it better. Yeah. But I think it's a different you know it's a of different course, it's, it's a different way of doing. It. I think the the real sort of and it, you know people get sort of angry about it, and I'm like, well, it's you know it's it's a different way of. Nobody gets angry when they see a whole bunch of modules that are explained in such a banal way. Mm. There is no magic and no excitement and no sort of explanation of why you should care that this will you know well that's an offset it. and turn you know so it's, it's, but the problem is that i don't care when i read the poetry yeah that I, in fact i become angry because yeah. i'm like you're you're deliberately obfuscating the intention and so i'm and not I able think, to even access an yeah. idea of what i could do so i'm the opposite of inspired i'm actually yeah. frustrated and i think that's, and that's and not clearly it. some people react in that way yeah. and other people you know he he I think no, you just have to buy, have I try a... buy these things and just go, well, I didn't fucking understand a word that he said, but I bought it because I like what he does. And I've subsequently come to learn what it does. Yeah. I love that. I think the other thing is it's, things. you know, it, it one of my big, which I'm sure we talked about last time, one of my big concerns with this whole scene is when it becomes a shopping scene. Yeah. You know, when well, it's it, like, it, how do it, I, how do I make always... this sound? And the answer is buy a new thing, which is, <sighs> insane yeah. and that doesn't happen in, like, in the normal world how do i make this new you know and you see it bits in online forums for things but generally i have a i have a fender telecaster how do i make it make this sound the answer is not buy a different guitar yeah. it, the answer is you learn how to how to do it yes um and i think with with his stuff there's an element of you buy it and then you need to learn it and you need to figure something out and you will see people buy it and they go I don't get it I want to get rid of it mm. by the way if you do want to buy a mannequin <laughs> do get in touch because I, I'm, I'm not loving that one oh mate <laughs> could it have been made bigger better think, if it was bigger I, th I, I can was I, that the beef? yeah I mean I can really understand what it's trying to do and as I said the fact it sounds so great there is something really really clever and interesting about it mm. and I can see that temptation to you know it's it's like it, to some extent there's this there's the sort of challenge you always have which is a feature creep you know and i find it particularly with anything digital i have this you know have this enormous temptation to make it do more things more so fire. this this one more here, eternal which is the which I is this out by the way? It's still not out, but I've what are you, I've basically what are you I, doing? <laughs> well, Get it's on partly this story. Yeah, it is basically that. It's like I got completely stuck with this incredibly simple. So this is a really simple clock divider. You tap so, that one. Show there. Um, you tap that. It gives you a clock, so you can trigger your Turing machine or your sequence, whatever, from it. Yeah. 
And the way it works now, you tap that and it, it's a division of it or a multiplication of it. So if this is going but 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 this one will go but but you know twice or okay. half as long or is it a bit like Tempe? Like, it's, I think it's a bit like Tempe. I haven't got a Tempe, but I think it's the same sort of idea. Tempe's got like a few clever ways of doing that. Like you tap yeah. three times and that well, creates a third division. That's exactly what I'm not doing. Okay. So I actually I prototyped it. I've had been prototyping for years, and I sent it out to a bunch of beta testers, and it had a a kind of Euclidean mode in it, yeah. where you kind of held something down and it you do this and people sort of quite liked it and I just thought this is just too much it's too yeah. much you know you can sit there having all these interface things and so I've taken that out it's now really really simple you literally tap it and it'll go faster you hold it down it goes slower by one and division by one division oh, yeah, yeah. so you hold you at some point they'll tap together hmm. and you can go down to like I don't know 32 taps 32 repeats and it will it remember that after power cycling yes oh, that's good yes yeah. That's um, like that's all it needs to be. I would, well, that's it. Because I would like I've definitely found like um, what was I doing the other day? I was doing some vid or something, and I was realizing like I've come to realize that I can't use a modular effectively if I don't have a clock divider. Yeah, like I absolutely that's must exactly have a clock it, divider, yeah. and yeah. so that's that is. Really and that was what it was wanting to get in really little dinky cases to have. So so the purpose of it was that, but that's where I got to talking about it was you have such a temptation to add features mm. um, and this one feels like it is doing so many interesting clever things but it's, it's it would have benefited just, from just, well just from it, you know you almost working. wonder if is there actually a beautiful incredibly simple like looper in yeah, there yeah that sounds beautiful that responds like tape that has the kind of overlaying thing um, but it's trapped in there because there is and it, and it may be actually if i was to really spend longer with it that you can just put it into that mode and leave it to just do that yeah um and that's where i was and i i that was interesting we were talking about andrew nonlinear circuits mm. his um kind of analog um purism i'm finding more and more attractive just because whenever i do something that has a computer in it i just find that really challenging and annoying <laughs> You, know, too you, much, just, too much black you just think there's too yeah. many opportunities yeah. and you just think, shall I add this, shall I add this, shall I add this? Like, you know, I would, I'm sort of doing a, a sequencer at the moment and it's got a computer in it. So you think, well, do I need to build quantizers into it? And then how many steps do I, how many different scales do I build into it? And then you interface to do those scales and then you just think, maybe I don't do that. And you just have a quantizer next to it. But... You and you when you when you start to show it to people, they can also immediately see those things. So yeah, they'll say, "Oh, it could do this thing. It could do this thing. It could do this thing." And you go, computer. Mm, it could stop talking. Whereas, whereas when you're um, in the analog realm, it's so incomprehensible what it's actually doing. Yeah, you know, I can you can look at this, and this is this is probably the ultimate analog feature creep because he's doing a lot of different things. Um, but that to me looks like in a weird, you know, because it is analog. You know, it it's not like this where like you're not going to have a good experience with this unless you learn what the buttons do. Yeah, with this you can just you push can the just thing probably, and exactly it yeah. around. Yeah, you know, and, and there's bits of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it and, and it's, it's fine. and it's that that being being limited. You know, being able to say this is and and you when you're designing out of you can get them to do complicated, interesting things, and you can start to create interesting interfaces, and you can have things that work. In very sophisticated ways, mm. but once you get into the computer land, it does become. It's just the the, the temptation. So I'm I'm definitely feeling in a bit of a. I think you have to do that thing mode. of design design the panel first, yeah, and just stick with that. Like, but that even you, then, you yeah, say like that. It's just that's what I want it. Just have a very clear design document. Yeah. It's like that's what it's yeah. designed to do, and just don't because it's yeah. It, I can imagine it would be all too easy. You just you to show it to someone and you go, oh, it could do this. And you go, yes, it could do this. Or you think, oh, I could make it do that. I think you just make it like open source or whatever, which you do. So yeah. you might as well just say, well, you, off you go. Off you go, go and make exactly. Which is very much like the mutable instruments things where yeah. people go and complexify, yeah. you know, add features to braids and stuff, which, yeah. you know. And actually, the, you know, radio music do. worked really, you know, very pleasingly in that way. And yeah. that people have said... I wanted to do something different. It becomes a chord organ. Right? Yeah, exactly. But I like that you had with chord organ, you've got a different panel. Like there is that yeah. kind of almost sort of insinuation that like, if you want it to be a chord organ, you should have a different panel. Yeah. And it therefore should be dedicated. 
I'm not yeah. interested in multifunction modules. So I no. find that. So have you got an ornament and crime? Yes. James okay. Brothers gave me his ornament and crime. So you are, have got a multifunction. I have got a multifunction module. But I think in the case of ornament and crime, because it has a screen, right, yeah. that it, 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 it is an acceptable, com what compromise the wrong word, but it, because it's got a screen, it's fine. Like yeah. I can, I have good visual feedback. I can understand why it's what it mode it's in and what it's doing. Yeah. The problem is that when you when you do what you're doing there, where it's like oh, we well, literally programmed it to do something else yeah, under clandestine hide. things, yeah. and you're using the panel no longer. The words don't represent yeah. what is it is. The ornament of crime is fine because it's the screen. The screen makes it obvious what's going on. Gives yeah. you clear visual feedback why it's doing a certain thing or what it's doing, and that's. It's fine. It's like yeah. such a good, it's a really good module. Um, yeah. And this is like a new, I discovered this year that there is a new firmware. Yes. Called, called? No, I remember there's something. Plinky like Plonk yeah. Mark IV, which yeah. is the new firmware um, that adds like an entirely another section of things. What was there? There was some, there was one of the modes that was the one I was the most interested. And they said, we've taken this out. <laughs> I was like, that's the most interesting one. That's literally the one. Yeah. So um, I was going to talk about habits. Have you, um, over the year, have you established any good habits or bad ones? New ones, I mean. Good or I new one, or bad habits? Like, no, I don't know. What's yours? Mine is, uh, and actually because of a podcast, so, yeah. so I've really thought about this, yeah. uh, is after I met Scanner, you know, he keeps a diary. Yeah. You know, he's kept a diary since he's oh, 12 yes. and he's 54 or something yeah. like that. And he really has, like, when I was yeah. there, he like, went to my birthday yeah. and told me what he was doing on the day I was born. Yeah. And there was a bit where he went quiet when wow. he was just reading stuff. And he was like, <laughs> okay. And I was like, whoa, what else happened that day? But he was like, he kept a diary. I was like, that's a good thing to do. Yeah. I've actually kept a diary since, I think it was July, yeah. I think I met him. Uh, maybe it was June. At the start of the month, I found a diary that was like a half year diary that, that coincidentally began at the end of yeah. the month when I bought it. So I was like, I'll start. And I basically kept about a week's worth of like in the book. Yeah. And then I had, to, I was away from the book. I was like, shit, I've got to do this. And so I've just done every one subsequently on my phone. And so and how so much have, do you write? I've written, well, I asked him this. He says he writes about a page in small, like tidy handwriting. Yeah. It varies. Like I'll write, you know, sometimes very little, but I only write very little when I've forgotten to do it and I've catch catching up. Right. Okay. It's interesting thinking about how your memory fades and what you remember yeah. is important over the certain over a certain time like i remember sort of funny quotes and things that like, yeah. my dad had said like for example there was in a cellar just is, is just nonsensical to me they said apparently in the cellar of our house they sometimes see a frog right and like I'm like there can't be a frog in the cellar because the frog will have had to have hopped in the house come through the kitchen wait for the door to be open gone in when the door that's the sort of thing frogs do <laughs> we have a lot of frogs here in the garden really yeah they're in there just in the grass how do they get here they live here did they get dropped by birds or something because no this idea, is an you, enclosed you, garden yeah but they? it's enclosed in that it's it's a whole bunch of gardens together with fences between them. they can, they can hop they can hop but they but you often see frogs here and <laughs> on, on only one occasion has one met an unfortunate end while mowing the lawn oh mate that's well, that disgusting that is awful yeah <laughs> frog again <laughs> um, try and avoid that but um basically there was a funny moment when dad i was like there's not a frog and dad said there is very often a frog <laughs> i was like which made me laugh um yeah like, i don't think i'm trying to think if this what i've been thinking about is it is the stuff i'm writing in this diary significant yeah you know is it important that i record yeah, but surely the writing of it is significant whether you're whether well, you actually look at it i again. thought about that idea of the does the writing process help me solidify yeah. what i did and better remember it but i forget what i've um written or like i've read i forget oh, what am i trying to say anyway but it's like it's, a lot of it's banal stuff but it's do you just, write notes in like meetings because i often write stuff down in meetings very very rarely go and look back at it yeah, yeah, and and I just, would do the same thing. Yeah. yeah, only write things when I've got a task to do. I might do this, do this. Wow. Have you ever read John Cage's diaries? No, how are they? Um, let's see if well, uh, you've got a few. Be, there might be one here. You've got some handy. Um, but they... You've got some excellent books. Shout yeah. out some of the. I'm going to like say the names of some of the books that I see because that's something that was kind of half visible in the back. Or, no, it wasn't visible in the podcast. I was trying to think. But about... I like you've got a Dieter Rams book. Which is called Less But Better. Yeah, that's a. There's a, there's a Vininger Arbabessa. There's a caged diary. 
That's a that's a very Lamont Young yeah. title. The diary is called Diary: How to Improve the World. Brackets: You will only make matters worse. John Cage. <laughs> oh my God. Is that the one that's all coloured writing? Yep. Yeah. So it looks. Um, it's very much like a mannequin's manual. Uglification. We're good at it. Single individuals without encountering obstacles darken the corners where they are. When Gandhi was asked what he thought of Western civilization, he said it would be nice. Incoming telephone calls, which will be the means by which one's social credit exceeds a basic economical security, social usefulness measured. It's very mannequin. Yeah. Actually, maybe Mannequins is just, he's just a John Cage he's just fan. Doing John Fair Cage. enough. All right. So he's got the... I'll take it all back. The, um, I think this is the stuff I used. So I wrote, I wrote a John Cage bot on Twitter. Yes, I know, yeah. And I think it's based I'm, on I'm, this I'm kind of it. Just, yeah. But I'd like, wait for you to retweet the best bits. So yeah, it does. Like, well, I, it, it I, I improved it so I need tweets every... It, it waits a random amount up to about 48 hours before tweeting again. So when I first did it, it was quite intense. And now it's calmed down. Fire hose, fire. And now it does it a really interestingly, just completely random moment. So it will just Can pop you, up. How did you get randomness? How was the you randomness? Just, it goes to sleep for a random amount what of about, time. It's um, very straightforward. You need to design an algorithm where the bot can decide how um, significant the thing it's come up with is. These are all significant when you read them. Oh, no, no. They're almost all really significant now. <laughs> What, all so the John this, Cage ones? All the John Cage ones. Well, the ones that... the This is one of the best books that I've got. This, this is... Uh, this is Bad Boy of Music by George Antheil. Antheil? So George Antheil, I don't know if I mentioned him last time, because I often... You did not. He, so he was a kind of 19... Must have been... So this was published in 1947, and he was active in sort of... Uh, beginning of the century basically sort of i think 20s and 30s um and he was a avant-garde kind of composer and it's just an absolutely amazing book so one of the stories he tells is he he's on a tour he's a piano player so he plays the piano and, and composes uh he is annoyed that there's a bit of sort of you know he's playing this really you know radical music and that the, the the crowd are a bit disruptive and you know it's not like a riot but they're a bit you know there's trouble there and he describes he goes to a concert and he uh goes onto the stage sits down you know the, the crowd is there he then shouts out to the um the kind of stewards or whatever he says uh ladies and gentlemen will you please lock the doors of the concert hall and they do and then he reaches into his pocket takes a gun out puts a gun on the top of the piano and plays and says, you know, and it was perfect. It was very well received. Very well received. <laughs> the audience were very polite. <laughs> <laughs> it was delighted. And so the... I bet they were. So they the book, applauded for hours and hours. The book is full of these just incredible stories. Like what? And he... And then in um, the, the best chapter, which I'll get you to read out the title, okay. the ch- total name is... Uh, so have you heard of Hedy Lamar? Yes. Okay, so let's get to... I'll get you to read out the title. Didn't Hedy Lamar invent, like, radar or something? Like, Hedy Lamar... Read, read the chat's title there. Oh, yeah, yeah, there we go. Hedy Lamar and I invent and patent a radio torpedo. Now, is this... I think the... In, uh, <laughs> just read it out from there. Right. This is so, worth, worth reading. What, this bit here? Read, um, Hedy Lamar wants to see you. Hedy Lamar wants to see you about her glands. <laughs> I said, "Uh uh-huh. They repeated, Hedy Lamar wants to see you. It's funny, I said, but I keep hearing you both say, Hedy Lamar wants to see you. That's what we said, they chorused. That's nothing, I said indifferently. Lana Turner, Betty Grable, Carol Landis, and the Snow Queen want to see me also. I just haven't met. Yes, but she does. She really does. So he meets meets Hedy Lamar, who was the most beautiful actress in the world at the time. And the two of them invent spread spectrum radio. Hedy has the idea because she's, you know, a massive science geek, basically. Right. And she, she understands that torpedoes, radio controlled torpedoes are very problematic because the enemy just figures out the radio controller and jams just, it. Yeah. It doesn't work. So she says, oh, OK, we can have, is there a way we can have the frequency hopping around? So it's got 20 different frequencies. As long as you synchronize the ship and the torpedo, it can hop around and nobody can jam it, which yeah. is how, how mobile phones work. 
he then so her friend um, George, <laughs> who then, he then says, I've just seen one of the last <laughs> he's, he's like, great. The way we can do this is we can essentially have a small player piano <laughs> at both ends because he's used to play a piano. He's experimented with them, and they create a kind of mechanical, you know, miniaturized system that can do this. They design it, they patent it, they go to the navy, and the navy are like. No, we are not going to put a player piano in our torpedoes and basically send them away. And then years and years later, uh, radio, you know, scientists start. I guess they probably had a similar idea, and they realised the whole thing's patented, and they did come up with what is like every them. phone, every Wi-Fi uses spread spectrum. Makes them hurt. But the way he tells it is just absolutely brilliant. Wow. So this is very fun. highly recommend it. If you're interested bad in books, boy of music. books about avant-garde composition. That's, that's the one. That's the bad one boy. Holy fuck. I don't think there's anything. And you can find it on, you can find them. They're not too expensive from them secondhand on Amazon. It's that's funny. amazing. Yeah. Trying to think, I haven't really read any books this year, which is slightly tragic. I've hardly been to any gigs as well. I went to see Alternate and C-Fax Acid Crew <laughs> playing at Pickle Factory. <laughs> and I went to some festivals, like I went to Gotwood, Houghton, which are all like techno, sort of modern techno festivals. Oh, yeah. Which is really good, actually. Like, there is, because, uh, you know, as a person who goes to festivals and is like, I like electronic music, I'm not very well, like, catered for yeah. at the modern the modern festival. I mean, yeah. maybe a little bit in kind of, you know, Hackney-based festivals. Yeah. I've, like, got a bit more electronic music. But like, festivals try to sort of cater to a perhaps more mainstream yes. crowd, which electronic music is just sadly not. Not. Have you seen James Holden this year? Uh, not this year, yeah. but I have seen him Very, play. Because I really like the Animal Spirits. Yeah. James Holden, the Animal Spirits yeah. album is quite incredible. Yeah, I saw that. I think I saw him twice this year. Really, really good. Oh, yes. Yeah. I've read, I actually specifically remember you tweeting about a gig. Yeah. And I'm trying to, me looking at tickets and not being able to get them. Yes. Well, now um, you live in the north. Yeah, well, it really definitely possible. won't happen now. <laughs> but he's like, yeah. What was that like? It was great. I mean, he's 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 always good, and it's just it's really interesting that that he's almost you know he's obviously generating a lot of it from his modular, and it's just synced up with the whole. And I don't know whether it's the band playing along with him mm. or whether the drummer is somehow synced to it, but it just you know works really well. Well, he's got like. Well, the thing that folks will know about is the Max MSP. Oh, yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I assume he probably uses that. I would have thought... Yes, so. no, he does. I'm sure he uses that. Where? Actually, there was a big... There's a big video I saw where he talks through the whole thing. And it oh, is... Yeah, it's all... just need to watch that. Yeah. Yeah, he's amazing. Yeah. Um, I'm like, yeah. I'm trying to think... I mean, in terms of, like, gigs, yeah, Alternate played some gigs, but festivals were like... Yeah, there were some amazing ones. And it's nice to go to... Like a pure electronic music thing where it's just all dance. It's like a dance festival. Yeah. Like that's, I'm quite into that. That's a nice thing. Just go and hang out. And especially like at, at Gotwood, for it. So, for example, we did a thing where, you know, we, during the daytime, had a little synth shack that we oh, set up. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we wore like white lab coats, uh, which have sort of like NASA patches on them. And Who stuff. else was at that? Somebody else who was... So uh, I was doing that with you, or yeah, yeah well, there's my friend Adam was doing it, right. but I don't know if yeah, I don't know, know. Six or six there, yeah. but like basically that, and we did that at, at Gotwood, which was incredible because you're you know you're there at a festival, and you know I've got a DFAM and a Drumber Impact, and and basically a little PA system, yeah, and a load of other stuff too, and we just get people to come up and just say, you come and you do it, you do the thing, yeah. you play the music, and you've got people who are like bombed out at the festival and are sort yeah. of you know somewhat worse for wear. But, like, having an absolutely brilliant time. Uh, and there was one moment where, like, I was just playing the DFAM and, like, or two DFAMs together and just, like, pushed the tempo ridiculously beyond where I would normally go, like, 150, 160. And I look up to my right and there are 30 people dancing to, wow. to what I was doing. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, you know, so I sort of just played for a bit and then stopped and then everyone was, like, applauding. I was like, that's fucking great. But it was that idea that we were talking about it. Adam was like... You know, Look at the young people. They bloody love fast tempos. It's fast yeah. tempos are the thing. Like none of this kind of like one twenty eight stuff. Like that's where that's Dad where house. people are going. Dad house. People yeah. want like people want push tempos. I don't know if that's actually true because I know very little about the general state of the music scene and what's yeah. what's hot and what's not. But I was like, yeah, I don't really mess around at that sort of speed, and it yeah. is quite good. I ended up thinking about making a kind of like, and this is something I, I will do is like a D fam inspired techno rig that's that's simple but 
brutal just based around yeah. that device. Which is well, you don't, fun. yeah, you don't need that much to do that sort of yeah, review. Like, yeah. You, you do. You do need a DX7 with it, though. You do I need. Was a DX7. What was I listening? I was listening to um. Those, those sweet marimba. Sellers. No, no, you do. You do hear DX7s on old techno records sometimes. Oh right? hell yeah! yeah all the time. Like, you just hell yeah! Like a lot of the old, especially techno and electro, like like those are all like cheap synths. Like yeah. none of them were done with like very few will be analog synths. No. It's like sort of you know the sparse pads like two watt. Like I was talking about the DX what seven one hundred yeah. DX twenty one. The more affordable end, like Aphex Twins' first yeah. synth was a DX100. So yeah. it's like, you know, the affordable, and that's why you hear those two op FM pads yeah. on like Selected Ambient Works and stuff, you know, especially Selected Ambient Works 2 is like such a simple patch, but just when you've got two, one operator just faded in, it just modulates the other operator, you get a yeah. wonderful, like, real sort of somber sound. You put that through a quadriverb or a yeah. reverb, it sounds awesome. Um, I would want, like, yeah, some kind of pad generator and then you need like a, a an old midi verb or whatever for the mm. whole i've got a quadra verb <laughs> yeah, for that. Yeah, yeah. exactly but i need like someone to do like a quadra verb. oh there is like that uh orteca verb uh which is like the the audio damage obviously right he, yeah. he is no longer with us yeah in the, he's gone to the great euro rat graveyard in the sky yes um but um yeah that would be part of it i think yeah um and that's something for 2019 i guess yeah um have you you've have you done any like changes to your music making process during the year? Have you learned probably everything? doing less? Yeah, because <laughs> I mean you obviously you do make things. I like, do make things. I mean, make I, modules, yeah. but like, I know that's not your it's not really your day job. So it's no, like, my so I, I yeah I don't I think I've probably been less productive than usual. I've got a busy busy day job year this mm -hmm. year. I've spent much of the year much of the year working in the fashion industry wow <laughs> in working well working for a big uh, magazine publisher yeah where they're doing stuff around fashion so it's been quite interesting having this tiny little view from from the corner of that of amazing entire, industry I mean, it's, a warehouse of an industry yeah just like such it. a fascinating interesting industry to just peek into what is, what's the, your sort of big takeaway from that? i mean just the, the the one of the really interesting things was the scale of it and the scale of so the scale of the luxury industry, yeah. which is isn't just fashion; it's like cars and holidays and 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 all that stuff. But it there was an amazing report came out just recently saying, if you look at the luxury industry now, it's something like nine percent of it is sold in China, and you go, okay, so China is kind of growing and important. They then say, okay, now let's look at what is bought by Chinese people when they're not in China and it becomes like 25, 30%. And then they look forward five, seven years. And then by 2025, they say it's going to be 50% of the entire luxury market is bought by Chinese people. So it's just all over, this the, world. All over the world. Yeah. yeah when, when they're traveling, but it was just that idea of this industry where the entire thing is being, you know, is, is, is going to need to change so much. You're going to need to be, understanding itself for a very different way and the mm. idea of it being kind of you know ateliers in paris you know and and you know rich european ladies is just a kind of weird little tiny subset of a subset of a subset and and that's that whole sector is changing so fast and mm. so so it's such an interesting area it's that the thing that's freaky about fashion is just the landfill aspect of like yeah i think of like primark yeah, the sheer volume. You know, if any of us were worried about like tossing a synth into like the, yeah. the the skip is like, like the sheer volume of cheap clothes yeah. that just like wear out and just get yeah. Like, and where do they or don't wear out going? and they get and and you do get don't even get sold. You get scandals about that. So um, H and M had a big scandal a few years ago when when that was real that was happening. There's actually a uh, a power station in like Stockholm or somewhere, that is partly powered by unsold, unworn H&M clothing that is fed in and you know, burns, generates heat. And I was like, do generation. the clothes somehow do that? Uh, got and, but yeah, that whole, I mean, there are so, it's just such an interesting, weird area. It's, it's, it's that whole sort of, the way it is to do with class and the way it's to do with people's personal identity and how they see themselves and these enormous supply chains around the world. Mm. 
Um, so it was nice to have a, a little peek into that <laughs> over the summer. <laughs> a very different oh world from where we are. Now, have you bought anything extravagant over the year? Apart from my DX7. That's in a very extravagant place. Yeah. The thing I love about buying, I bought a DX7 as well, not yeah. this year, but <laughs> I love, I love how cheap it is yeah relative to what it cost when it was on in the showroom and i'm always tempted by that when you see <laughs> i was looking at it today on the sound on sound have their their um like classified ads mm. oh my and God. you see things like one of those massive yamaha digital mixers that were massive like 10 years ago yeah. they're now you know 200 quid yeah, <laughs> yeah. So they would have, they would have been like eight grand or something when they came yeah, out. Yamaha still make the L1V, I think. Probably, yeah. yeah. Well, they 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 are remarkable. How cheap, and I I have no possible need for one. Mm. Wouldn't want one. They are super but that, cheap. That world of just those things where the where the price completely evaporates. Disappears. If you like, if you find an old sound, I sound like I've got a fun one from like eighty eight. Yeah. Where it's like just compare the disparity between computer prices oh, and yeah. analog synth prices. Yeah. It's just that one, and it's like. And samplers, you know, which was yeah. like, that was the means by which, you know, your, your Atari and your sampler, that yeah. was your system, you know, and I, there are, but there's still bargains to be had. I think, but I, I feel like it's changing the fact you pay, you said you paid 300 quid for that. I think so. That's yeah. Like, it feels like a lot to me. Yeah. And I mean, it's a, coming. It was, it was, in, well, it was in, like, in very should. good, very good condition and it's DS7 too. So I didn't really want to, I mean, I think you that's, that's like, no, I didn't want a, a the, you know, I didn't want the memory. I want the nice, nice keys. But it's like I love, I love how the original one looks like. It's, you know, it's brown. Yeah, it's it's not even brown. it's not even slightly brown. It's this very is, brown. No, I like this. Is you know, this is, this slightly, is like, slightly more eighties. Yeah, it's a well, different. You know, this is what what um you know the guy in American Psycho would be playing. I think. Yeah, I think you're probably right. <laughs> he would definitely he have, would have the two. Wouldn't yeah. he? he would, he have, would the definitely have the two. He'd have the two yeah. D, and he'd have a lot of diskettes with like yeah. sort of Huey Lewis and the newest. Yeah, news, exactly. Sort of yeah, the FD with the with the disc drive. Yeah, yeah. Nice. The um the one of the other talks at CV Freaks was Francis Morgan, who writes for the Wire, talking about uh, the um, EMS Synthy One Hundred. I saw the James Brothers about this. Yeah, yeah, this was it was just amazing how. I think they built 30 of them, possibly. They reckon there's about 10 that still exist. There may be fewer, maybe more, but they, they, they know of about 10. They've just been, you know, some of them ended up taken to pieces in boxes and stuff. So Tom from um, uh, Analog Solutions or System, Tom Carpenter, he's got he, one. he got one in boxes that he's having to... You know, yeah, put yeah. back together it's an ultimate project but there's there, there was a terrible photo in the talk of the one in belgrade belgrade were the people who commissioned it and francis worked with them a lot writing it and there's been fully restored and is all all working and very active there's a picture of it in the 90s literally shoved into the corner of the studio mainly used as a stand the stand for floppy disks <laughs> for, the, like for the rack of samplers next to it uh, but just you know, the, such an interesting thing because it's that it's pure interface. You know, yeah. it's this amazing two enormous pin matrices, and then the, um, there was a really nice clips of people playing them in in Belgrade. I think there's a nice yeah. album of you know basically people doing techno on them. Yeah, but you know, in really interesting ways. The um, one of my favourite things I urge any listener to seek is the. A new sound of music documentary oh that? yes yeah and in that there is is probably peter howell or someone from yeah. the radiophonic workshop where there's like a truly delightful section where he synthesizes the sound of robot mice yeah. emerging from the thing and he's like you know he's like no, i'm just going to try and achieve their whiskers now i think <laughs> like that's a, and actually gets a sound that makes me think of robot mice so is like, that the one with the weird guy in the background uh there's one doc. One of those. Oh, doc, I know the one where he one. like kind of peers in, like <laughs> sort one, of yeah. like in Twin Peaks, yeah. like Bob. From Twi- no, 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 no. That's like a more modern one. It's like um, so. This is the older one. This is, this the... is from seventies, okay, and it's yeah. got um, yeah. who's the dude who presented Tomorrow's World? Oh, okay, Michael. I can imagine, yeah. and he's re- he's really good. I really like his like delivery. Yeah. He's got this slightly tongue in cheek. You know, he's sort of a bit serious, but yeah. having fun with it. So he's like, <laughs> and when he does it, like. 
he goes, he's not just telling you about something. They've actually set up a like a Nagra with like a tape yeah. loop. So he's yeah. like, and if I took this tape and I rolled it in reverse, then something very strange <laughs> would happen. And it's like, ooh. ooh. And then um, it's brilliant. But it's like a wonderful doc. And then obviously... There's also like, um, who's the fella from White Noise? Oh, Vorhaus, David Vorhaus. David Vorhaus, yeah. who I saw, I like, I walked past him at uh, Synthfest. Oh, wow. And, like, he was just walking past, I was like, David Vorhaus. I was like, so, you look a lot older than when I saw you in that documentary. So there's a story about him which I am not at all certain about. <laughs> what do you mean? But is that he's he is, true. Or no, is that, is that he is in some way the person who created the Fairlight Orch. Orchestra Hi. five, no, the orchestra stab. <laughs> yeah, that that is basically him. Really, and that a that ultimate sound of the eighties of those Hi. orchestra stabs on all the Hi. like U two records Hi. and and everyone uh, was That's my impression of it. was him. That's yeah, good, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, you've you've got it just right. <laughs> it's my DX seven marimba as well. <laughs> <laughs> like that's the slap bass. Um, so you haven't bought anything extravagant? Did DX7? No, I don't think I've bought anything... Not a music on this Extravagant? No, I don't think so. I think I've been fairly, you know, busy and... and Too busy to like, to, like, justify so, buying toys for yourself. Yeah. You've got, like... Show me this. This is your Nagra. This is the That's Nagra, a yeah. very nice Yeah, object. this was a very nice thing. Oh, so. Was it a lot of money? No, no. Well, they're, they're... I think it was about... Three, four hundred quid, that sort of thing. I mean, for, again, for they, they are absolutely incredible Eesh. objects. Are they Swiss? They are. They are Swiss, I and mean, like this one's Swiss. got batteries in it, so it's really, really heavy. Oh but if we put a, um, you got, you haven't got the little one. No, I bet you want the little one, don't you? The little one's quite. I mean, that quite, is a that's beautiful thing, object. Yeah. That's like the sort of Cold War one. Yeah. So um, that's the one that's in the wire, where they're like, they're all complaining, like. I can't take fucking Nagras. <laughs> like a fucking Nagra? And I'm watching that and I'm like, mate, like, Nagra's cool. <laughs> so let's see. You should be glad you're not going to. to work. So. Which bit's the capstan? Uh, is that a thing? Was that that was cigarettes, isn't it? I think capstan. It's that fella. There is a, that's a capstan. It's like that word, capstan. Uh, I need your cup of tea. <laughs> oh, man, oh you're running it around the room. I need my cup of tea, too. Wait. Uh, there's got to be something there. Objo dark. No, what about that? What's that? That object. Uh, that thing is just. I mean, what even is that? That's a, um, what is that? What the it's a hold. What? Don't tell me. Don't tell me. Don't work it out. It's very Tom, what useful. the God's name is this? Oh wait, I think it's something for tuning drums. No, I think it's a gear shift accessory for a very posh Swiss car that you've got. I don't know what that is. What it is that? Is it's really heavy as well. It's for holding holding circuit boards while you're soldering them. So you put them on like that. Oh, you squidge them in there. That is a it's beautiful. Deeply over-engineered thing. Why does it even look like that? It's so odd. <laughs> oh, nice. Okay, you might need a finger there. Well, what about your? If that will work there. They do. I think that must be the whirly. That's nice, isn't it? Oh, the remix, the dance version. And then probably it will be improved. As they normally are. By turning it over. What, so you're playing it off, the, playing it. The, off the knot? No, so you're playing off the nose. No, so you're playing off backwards. So oh, I see. I'll go there, I think. Sounds like the start of a crowd rock tune. Or a fortet tune. Yeah, there you go. That's all he's doing, but with audio mulch. Yeah, I didn't mind. that's what it's for. It's Actually, great. <laughs> but yeah, they are, it's an amazing thing, and actually. 
you can pile it in. What does that even mean? I don't know. Well, I mean, they're obviously they have yeah, all this you weird. Take its little light. Take its face off. Is it from there? And where it works. Oh my god. They're absolutely incredible inside. Just so clean and perfect. And these kind of crazy little circuit boards that have these weird gold contacts that connect them all together. It's really like it is super clean. Yeah. And like tidy. So this is it's I like think it's a product of a very organized yeah, mind. It's basically as old as me, I think. Like twenty. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a nineties one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Look at that, like multi wave yeah, switch thing. It's just, you know, they are it's pretty it's nice. Proper, proper. I mean, you imagine what they would have cost when they were when they were new, and yeah. that thing of just what what it's actually worth compared to what you're paying for it now. And the fact it runs off batteries is quite amazing. Yeah. Well, I've got the Zoom F4 here, which is the mo really the modern Nagra. Yeah. I mean, the weight is slightly. It's <laughs> things have changed. Let's be honest. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. I did like. Um, I think um, if I make an ex not extravagant but a sort of unnecessary but fun purchase in 2019, it will be yeah. one of those nice Sony cassette like three head uh, cassettes yes, yeah. with a Phantom Power mic pre's on yeah. them and stuff. Like you can get these like really lovely like cassette players, which yeah. are very high quality. Like you know they're, they're the equivalent of a. And they're not cheap. No. Like they'll be 150 quid yeah. or something for a good one. And that's for, but they're for playback or for recording as well? Well, they're for recording. I think they're so like you know, the Warman used, Pro sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But they'll be used by journalists like rec yeah. like this. You'd yeah, be yeah. recording an interview yeah, to cassette. Exactly. But I like, it's that musician uh, Heinbach, like inspired oh, yes. by him yeah. Yeah. doing like Foley recording with a cassette. Yeah. You know, so not using a Zoom F4, but using a a dirty method to yeah. like capture your sound and then build tunes out which yeah. to me felt like a it felt like a way of using tape that I would actually probably do yeah. do you know what I mean like I mean that's I the just, thing with this it's gonna... beautiful to have and you do occasionally exactly. do things like that with it but it's it is it's kind of a ball like, it's yeah. just like I'm not I could do this or I could just put some plugins on and, make and you're not tempted to get a uh, a four track and start recording everything to cassette. I've already got a four track. Got I've got a Yamaha MT100. And do you use it? No, no, no. I never used it. I've never used it. But I like I like the idea of using it. Yeah, and that's why I have it, and I feel better that I've got it than I never used. I it. I like this thing. Um, yeah. That that approach of just being able to say, this is the Electro know. Harmonics 2880 Super Multi Track Looper. Yeah. So yeah, like this would be. And you know how this connects to what we were talking about earlier. Which is designed, I think, by David Cockrell of EMS. Is it? Who also designed this Akai oh, S612. Did he? That, and that is something I want. And I mentioned may before. Have, may have done the... He designed the S612. Yeah, I think like so. The yeah. S612 has the best interface of any sound. Well, that's got an amazing, beautiful interface. And it just also, it just sort of works and sounds really nice. And it does, it's very... It's just got a lot of weird sort of, you know, just weird, but you reverse things and then record over them and then reverse them back and you can pitch things up and pitch things down. It's quite... I'd rather have this than that, I think. It's I mean, a little like, bit more practical. Yeah, 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 sure. But just so you could maybe do more, like, with the, if your goal is, loop, you know, building a... Yeah. I mean, presumably the big modern kind of ones with, like, 16 channels and all, you know, there's a there's a big, chunky new electronic one that's got... The, well, I was, uh, you know, I was seeing um, Beardy Man like playing with his like uh, latest yeah. Beardy Tron, which has yeah. got he's using the Boss like one with little circular pads to like yes, as yeah. part of his rig. And what he is doing is is really quite amazing. Yeah, I mean, if you watch some of his like recent vids, yeah, uh, I highly recommend. Just, 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 I mean, he's very funny, but just, just conceptually, what he's able to throw out in a yeah. fraction of a second, because. Yeah. You know, because he uses his voice, it's like it really is the it's the brain to techno interface. It's yeah. just like with the most like the smallest amount of time, you can just translate a thought into yeah. into real music. But you like within seconds, yeah. it's like amazing. So music, yeah, some good music has come out yes. in twenty eighteen. What is your? I did make a note because I was trying to remember. I was trying to think what I had listened to. So I did seem to have been listening to. The, have you listened to the Fortet live stuff that's on Spotify? 
No, but I've listened to his. He is his album the one that he made with and um, with all the gear that he used. Is that did that come out this year? Because that's really well, good. Yeah, though. it was this year or last year. And he also did the new Nana Cherry album, which is very good. Yeah, I've not heard that. Uh, but yeah, if you're on Spotify, you look up the artist Forty LR. For yeah, Forty LR. That's the stuff that was just on Spotify. And it's he's just basically started dumping loads and loads of live sets on there. Right. So you get like him. 40, what's it? 40, 40 LR. 40 LR. And I think if you search for names of his songs, it comes up. Because right. they all have the right, the right names. track names. Yeah. So he'll have like a set from him playing at Funk House last year or yeah. a set from him playing in Japan like in 1990 something. Oh, wow. Uh, and they're really nice. You end up listening to, you know, I've ended up listening to them a lot. Mm. Um and the other, have you heard this Aiko Ishibashi album? No. So it's called The Dream My Bones Dream. And there's this guy on Twitter called Frozen Reads. who's yeah. just been going on about it for, for like every day for about three months. It's like a, a marketing um, bot for the... But it is, it's really, really good. It's, it's not especially electronic, but it's it's got bits of it that are. But it's just an amazing kind of mm. weird, unusual album with lots of kind of, I guess, orchestral bits in it and it's got singing on it and stuff. Is it it's, Japanese? It's Japanese. Sounds, sounds like yeah, it's Japanese singer. Uh, I think if you look look them up, there's bits of, you know, it's kind of sort of jazz background, I think, mm. and experimental. I don't know much about it, but it is an amazing yeah, check record. That, that sounds great. And then the other one, I've been listening to some of that sort of, you know, that's the, all that sort of... Um, 80s fair lighty kind of Japanese stuff you know there's, there's a lot mm. of that that sort of stuff around <laughs> was listening to so everyone knows all Jean-Michel Jarre's really old kind of like oxygen concept classic albums. sort of 80 the like 70s synthesizer records that you know I remember hearing when I was tiny and you know they, they sort of still around um, he made an album a few years later called Zoo Look mm. which is absolute pure 80s Fairlight music <laughs> it's loads of kind of like African samples through Fairlights and just ridiculous it's like a kind of an 80s TV ad that would probably have Grace Jones in it sounds <laughs> amazing quite funny <laughs> So is, what it about, like, is it quite cheesy or is it good? Uh, no, it's it good? kind of, it's not, it's not, it's not, that's the thing. it's not Jean-Jean comical. It can be so cheesy. But yeah, it's like, not, yeah. it's, it's, it's obviously, you know, fairly John michel mm. but it's, um, it's quite, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's just a crazy sounding record. You know, Zuluk. I, yeah, I can't I, say I've listened to it that my, much, but it's mate really of mine, his, his band is called Zuluk. Right. Okay. <laughs> so it's from that. Yeah, right? I assume so. Yeah. I assume so. What about you? Um, well, I made a note. I was like, you know, it's a bit obvious, but um, well, there's no, there's one less obvious thing. But to shout out two things is the new Apex like EP thing. Oh, I haven't listened to the new one. Which is like, you definitely listen to that. Yeah. That's, I mean, because obviously the music that he's been putting out in kind of semi recent years has been a bit, you know, he's put some, some rather difficult stuff like the computer controlled instruments and like yeah. the cheetah, you know, thing, which yeah. is kind of like conceptually him just kind of farting around yeah. with some old ob- obstinate gear yeah. and you know making simple techno but then this is like him just sort of doing something a little bit akin to like a 2001 era sort of quite intense jungle uh, okay yeah. like yeah. again but made with a circle on right, made yeah. with a piece of hardware made with hardware samplers and yeah. made with analog synths so yeah. like in a really obstinate methodology to like and a very technical and difficult way of doing it yeah um actually i bought a circle on during the yes year, partly because of this ep which is so it's not because of the ep i mean i thought about buying a circle on before but listening to the ep reminded me about my interest in that device does it just immediately sound like apex when you plug it in what the circle on? well yeah. it doesn't sound like anything because it's just a sequence. It's sequence i know but the sequence the the patterns, the patterns on do it, like one thing, for example, that's on that EP um, is these really fast, like one twenty eighth sort of like rolls. Yeah. Can, like where yeah. it's like very fast sweep up rolls. Yeah. Like, that's really easy to do on the circle right, because yeah. you can. What's like one sort of like I, I'm and I say this as as a person who's like this. The way it was described to me, someone was like, "If oh the circle on, you'll hate it for at least a year." Right, as you have to learn it. Yeah, yeah. it's it is the quintessential. 
difficult piece of equipment to crack. It's very electrony in the sense of it's right, like, yeah. it's like one person's somewhat obstinate vision on what how you know, sequencing should be. How sequencing should be. And, yeah. and it's also like it's evolved organically, things have been tacked onto it. Ideas okay, people. So there is probably quite a lot of it. I think there is a lot of feature creep yeah. in that sense. So it's important that you understand what those things are and kind of know what you want to use and what you don't. So you're not but I am finding it very difficult to get a bird's eye view of the device. Like it's yeah. it's the documentation is is well written but lengthy. It comes with it, it comes it's with like, like a, a sciencey but it's it's like um it's actually a ring binder, but it's in its own little, like, sort of really nicely finished plastic thing that folds over and seals. It's like very, it's like the kind of thing that I would imagine the Synthy 100 had, yes, like a yeah. like a proper lab book that yeah. you open up. But um, by doing those drills, like, for example, you, like on an, other sequences, you would normally have to change the time base if you were like, oh, I want to do 30 seconds. Right, like, I have yes, to change the yeah. time base. It's half that. Yeah. Like, whereas on this, you can just zoom in. So you go, and you just can and then you're at the yeah. 128th level and then you just run your finger. Right. And then okay, yeah. another thing, you've got like a row of 16 knobs. If you want to change velocity yeah. per step, like you can do a thing where if you push and hold the left encoder and you push and hold the right encoder, yeah. if you turn the right encoder, a very it, good creates, here. It, <laughs> it, <laughs> it creates a ramp. So right. if I turn oh, okay. the right, see, the yes. ramp goes yeah. up. I turn it's left, the ramp yeah. goes down. So I can yeah. go ramp up, ramp down, ramp yeah. up, ramp down. And I mean, obviously on a computer, you can draw with a mouse. Yeah. But if you want to have a very specific curve, you just go, Whoop, and in that one motion, I've done it. Yeah. And then you can also put gang and go tap, 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 and hit the little buttons. Yeah. Sorry, I was spat on you there. Um, can be getting excited. And then if you adjust one, it will adjust all those levels okay, equally. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it becomes very, it's like a physical interface. But you have to but learn it. Have you ever had an NPC? No. Because I, I had one briefly right. and didn't, I mean, I had one for a few years and I, and I didn't completely get into it, but there you very much get, I mean, there's an amazing video of a guy, well, there's lots, but there was an amazing video the other day of a guy, it was a, I think it's a Scottish hip hop producer cutting up beats on it. And it's just incredible. It's literally like he's touch typing. Right. But with with a with a it's got a big scroll wheel. I think yeah. it was like a two thousand, and just literally doing this, like he's do, it. like almost just waving his hand. Yeah, he's almost but, not touching but it. But absolutely, like he's touch typing it, and he's just yeah. you know trimming it, and he's got so because that was what I found interesting was the muscle memory mm. you get from it. And that, you, and you, you, that's so you funny. These are things that you can hundred percent you get muscle memory. Yeah. Interestingly, I I crashed my circlon yeah. within two days of owning it. Right. Yeah, and which sounds like really like what the fuck? You paid two thousand pounds for yeah. a device that just crashes, and hardware sequences never crash. It's like yeah. eh, they do. Um, anyway, but it, you know it is very stable, and in terms yeah. of timing, it's like got the best timing. Yeah, yeah. This side of an Atari ST, but yeah. You know, interestingly, I email Colin Fraser. You know, he's the inventor, and it's his baby. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, it's it's funny. People who are new to the Circlon tend to crash it because they use workflows which are unusual right, because they've okay, not yeah. they've never used the circle they haven't, they haven't learned the right way to navigate through and there's there's a there's common yeah. pathways that people will begin to use once they become familiar yeah. with the device and, I was like, and is there a big community of people how does yeah. it work there's a big there is, there's like a, there's, there's a, a facebook cult. there's a private cult facebook group yeah and Genuinely, you're not allowed into that group unless you own a Circlon. Right. I yeah. don't know. I didn't have to. I don't know how. I can't remember. I don't think I had to prove anything. I like send a picture of me naked, <laughs> stood with it, like you know, today's paper or something yeah. like. And so um, I basically, yeah, I was let into the group, but like there is, yeah. And, and if you email Colin, he'll reply. You know. Yeah. And he's so pals with Aphex. There's a lot of things that are in the Circlon which will be ideas from Aphex. You know, in terms of it can do some really nutty things. Yeah. Like for example, it can. You can have sequences running and the sequences can like a little relay can pass notes over to each other and say, you play this note on this bar, okay. I'll play it next bar. You know, it's that kind of thing. Yeah. They swap data. You can have them temporarily swap data between okay. each other. That sort wow. of nutty. And there's a lot of, you know, And it produces CVs, does it? Yeah. Um, so yeah. I, I bought like, I was like, I'm going to do this and it's extravagant. I'm going to get the, I'm going to go for it and I'm going to get, you get a CV board and a module and so, and it, it, yeah, it produces like a whole load of CV. So it's, it's amazing because yeah. you can have this one device, you know, it replaces a, a Mac in the sense yeah, that yeah. it's one device yeah. that will sequence all your hardware, you know, via MIDI, it's got five MIDI ports and yeah. it will sequence all your CV stuff 
Yeah. And it's got USB and it would sequence the computer too. So yeah, yeah. you can have this one device and you can sit in front of it and make tunes, you know. Yeah. And when I've set it up, I'll have like my modular with a few bits of like shapeshifter sound. The 808, I've got the, the, the system, yeah, yeah. like analog 8, 8, yeah. 808. I actually want to try the TRL8 because you start to like love MIDI because you're yeah. like, I want velocity control and yeah. I want panning yeah. control and like, and so, and yeah, you just, and you just sit and you go, well, these are my options I presented to myself and here's my interface. And you then know, you record it on your four track. Yes, then I record it. No, I'll bounce it down to like my big two track. That you I'd buy got. a lathe cutter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just drop the needle and like, here yeah. we go. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you just, you make music and it's, it is good. And you, you can have that same experience with like the, I would say like the push, the, the two things are the push and the beat step pro. Like yeah. if anyone is like vaguely fetishizes it, but it's like, A, I don't want to wait two years and B, I don't happen to have 2000 euros just yeah. lying around, uh, which is obviously a bit of an investment. Yeah. Then, like the the push, I would say is like the closest thing to the experience of it because the push has yeah. got some of that kind of electron. You know, you can hold buttons down on the push and change yeah. Yeah. change step values, which you can do. You know, the circle on is similar in the sense that you can bake data into each step. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's like you know, effectively, it's kind of like you're just interacting. Plus, the push via your computer can then edit hardware since you could be playing yeah. a DX7 yeah. through it. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, you can have that similar experience. It's so just, it's a luxury to have a hardware sampler now then, aren't you? I You've own got several now. Oh, several. Um, I, I started like, I, I, my A4000, which was, I got when I first started, my mate has got and he said I can have back. And I'm, yeah. I would like it back. What's the, the A4000? That's a... So it was the silver face with a big green screen on it. Right. It, it was a sort of, it's like late 90s and it was basically Yamaha... You know, okay. it was it was the it was Yamaha having a good go at making a really nice sampler. They've obviously yeah. made samplers, you know, and actually one of Apex's favourite samplers is a, an older Yamaha. Yeah, yeah. Which he uses with like a weird OS yes. version, like JJ OS thing. Yeah. But like, it was really friendly to use. Like I remember, and I also specifically remember thinking how good the A4000 sounded. Like it had yeah. its own effects. You know, you can just you know got samples and you're banging them through effects and it's it's just nice yeah, hardware yeah. it was yeah it was expensive ish I, mean, I think it was 800 quid when i bought it in the yeah. early noughties or whatever but i would like that back and so you then need some floppy disks uh, i've actually got a zip drive for it and actually <laughs> i bought the jj not jos the hxc thing because I, I acquired a that's where it's like the a floppy disk emulator oh, okay yes yeah, so it's an sd card yeah, yeah. So and I, I acquired that but i've got an s 3000 XL, yeah, and I borrowed an MU um, 6400, whatever yeah. it is, like the big MU. Wow. I've now got loads, which I'm then I just don't have time to learn because they're just yeah. annoying. But I, I just found the whole thing anyway. The point was with his album, yeah, like there is a couple of tunes that are just like exquisite, sort of you know, mental roller coasters, yeah, yeah, and that the. the you know, they're twisting, so sort of, I'm going to sound slightly like I love the guy, but it's like they are twisting sort of, you know, certain styles in, in just interesting ways. Like yeah. nobody is making, nobody makes music quite like that guy. I don't think yeah. anyone's got the patience or the, 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 the sort of artistic touch. Yeah. And that he's also able to just do things with samples where it's like, I just like, I just couldn't be bothered. Like you can hear yeah. that he's baked. I was like, how has he got like all these spot effects on like, you know, there's like suddenly there's a huge reverb wash. I'm like, yeah. how are you doing that with hardware? Because you can't have like a mixer that's got yeah. MIDI controlled sends. I don't think you've got that. And of course, the answer is that he's baked the effects into like one shots. Yes. So he's done a, like passed it through the quadriverb, baked it in. And then that one note is just that one special sample. All the whole thing's a line. He did it on a plane on Able. Yeah, to. exactly. It's all just bollocks. <laughs> Absolute nonsense. Yeah. And we're great. just like buying it hook, line, and, and he's sink. got he's got four blokes in Albania to make them. <laughs> yeah, it's just do all the tunes. <laughs> he's on holiday. And it's taken yeah. five years to put this out. Yeah, well, they're not very good. So he has yeah, to do this. <laughs> but yeah. they're cheap. I'd like, I could believe that. I mean, that's why not. But I, I thought it was good. Um, but actually, my major music discovery yeah. was, uh, have you heard of Susumu Yokota? Oh, yes. Um, is that the, what album is it? The... Uh, Sakura. They obviously have multiple albums, but the one that I've been like, obsessing over I is think Sakura. I was listening to the one that's like lots of, um, is it the one that's got lots of classical samples on it? There are, there are some samples on it that are like, there's definitely music for 18 musicians. 
Like, yeah, dun, there was dun, a, dun, what, dun. it's like the start of Pulse's one. It's I wonder like, if it's the one I'm thinking of that's, that's, um, so it's Yakota. Susumu Yakota. I think I got that right. Susumu. Is, it, is he the one yeah. who died? He's died, yeah. He this is the one I was looking entirely at. Entirely brown bread. Um, Traveler in the Wonderland on it. Symbol was the one I was looking right, at. Yeah, that's got, amazing. I'd like, we, I've, I've listened yeah. very little else of his music. Yeah. I just like, I've found this one album and just like, you know. So which is the one you were listening to? Sakura. Sakura, back there, Seth 99. So Sakura is, yeah, that is just a brilliant, 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 brilliant album. It's like what I want from yeah. sort of ambient music. Well, Symbol is amazing. It's loads yeah. and loads of like just weird orchestral samples. It's like an orchestral mashup now, mm. but quite interesting, quite nicely done. Yeah, nice. From back in the day. Yeah, I like him. Yeah. And he, but he's gone. That's yes. sort of the, like Mark Bell. I was talking yeah. about... That's like continues to like bum me out that yeah. Mark Bell is like not not alive. Yeah. Mainly because just didn't release any music that was like within the last sort of fifteen years of his life. Right, well, yeah. it's you know, yeah. just like he was working with other people. And like, yeah. For God's sake, just like put your music out yes. because you might get hit by. A well, bus. that was where one of the albums I listened to a lot this year was the um, that Prince album that he put out called Piano Micro and a Microphone which is a recording, I think, probably on cassette, judging from the sound of it, of Prince sitting at a piano in about 1982, 1983, and just playing. Oh, my God. It is absolutely <laughs> extraordinary. Because it's literally, you know, there's, there's chunks of it where he's just... You can hear him having the ideas, and there's bits where he's playing on the piano and he's singing, and then he just... Start starts like singing a bass line bit or a brass bit that he's kind of just imagined there and yeah, comes yeah. out. And he does like about 90 seconds of Purple Rain before he gets bored and moves on to the next thing. And the first song on it sounds like this this kind of like a house record almost. It's got him, he's just stamping on the ground. So it's like a kick drum. Mm. And it's this kind of gospel y, piano y thing that just sounds a lot like house records that people would nice. make about five years later yeah, yeah, yeah uh and it's yeah it's really kind of hissy and a couple of bits where the tape seems to get mangled so but it it's spotify, absolutely incredible. It's on spotify yeah he put it out Down it's a proper album it's called yeah. Down a microphone but it was interesting some you know i was talking about it on a on on a forum and people were saying well it's really you know you shouldn't listen to that because he didn't want it to be put out oh which was really interesting you know they're like you know it's, it's not it's not it's not canon. It's not well. It's not kosher to listen to something that he would have actively not wanted to put mm. out. He would have gone. Why are you listening to that? Well, oh, I don't know whether his attitude would have been. I am angry. That's a private piece of music that's mine. Yeah, like or, reading my diary, or, or it would you know. be like the sort of Don Buckler thing of why would somebody want to listen to that? It's not very well recorded, mm. and I haven't finished the songs. But it's just an absolutely extraordinary thing to mm. listen to. Yeah, it's just sort of hearing and understanding of someone's process to, to a degree, yeah. like a peek behind the curtain of something that was and got, not at one yeah. point fully formed. Obviously. You feel like it is literally bursting out of him mm. <laughs> you know, while, he's, while mm. he's playing it. Yeah. That's, I mean, that has been, yeah, that's something I'm trying to, like that beardy man thing is a good example. It's obviously not the same process, but just where someone has managed to find a way to make technology work for them to 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 just allow music to flow yeah. and that's ultimately what we're all sort of seeking to some degree is especially with modulus because they are a very immediate yeah so i just want immediate results and yeah. i want an immediately joyful you know fully well maybe fully formed is the wrong word but it's just that idea of having the shortest amount of sort of delay between some you know you're doing yeah. something something good happening yeah and it's it's probably why you know modular is addictive is yeah. because it's just you're chasing the sort of ideal system, but it's it is just very gratifying to hear yeah. instantly hear something come back. It's not like I suppose the the opposite kind of thing would be like animation, where yes. you know it's that's such a delayed gratification. You've got yeah. to be slaving for years, and then the final result will be extraordinary. But you know you don't get to enjoy it for with music's just such a it's just instantly gratifying. Well, I think it's the it's also the making music to listen to while you're doing it. Mm. You know that different. You know because I don't, I don't really record anything at all now. But you, I will enjoy. You're like Lamont Young. You know. But I know. <laughs> but I will, I will enjoy sitting and 
playing something, listening to it, mm. and having it, you know, sitting there making something, you know, doing something. And it's not really a process with any aim in mind because I'm not going to really do anything with it. Mm. But it's a, it's just a, an enjoyable thing to do. Like sitting playing playing guitar is enjoyable. You're not yeah. planning to, you know, nobody's listening to you. You're not going to record anything. But it's a nice thing to, you know, it's a thing you do. Mm. That's what um, I think. Who is it? Was, someone was mentioning that they make occasionally. I was one of the guys who works for Reason. Matthias Hagstrom, I think I probably get his name wrong, but he's like, we sometimes make a patch for the office to just play yeah. back. And someone just wires up a little thing and it just, a little music box, yeah. like the Buddha box. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think that's a really nice, interesting, interesting idea. Maybe you need the right office to have it. Yes, you need tolerant. But, you know, we used, to, yeah, we used to work in an office. They had an office DJ, so you had... Really? <laughs> that, well, this is Mixmag. Oh, uh, okay. So yeah, Mixmag, you had... A, you had Stan Farrow, who was the whose business card said off his DJ, and that was his job. Oh, he also nice. ran a lot of other things, but oh, okay. but he was you know that was you know you did have decks in the office, and you obviously had to listen to a lot of music because you music magazines quite important to listen to a lot of music. If I imagine what's that, happening, that makes sense. Yeah, nice. But yeah, I think an office modular is essential for the modern <laughs> office. Preferably a large, expensive one with lots of my modules yeah, yeah. in it. Yeah, cool. <laughs> So then, have you got a lesson, so like anything you've learned, or like anything that you would be mindful as you we now enter the dangerous or glorious year of 2019, which is actually the year, is that where Blade Runner is? It's actually 2019. Oh, is it? Yes. Because we've gonna, had all I'm our incest now, dates, actually. So I'll be in Los Angeles in 2019. Fantastic. Wicked. Yeah. <laughs> it is, isn't it? Yeah, I, yeah. Think, I think it is. So what, like, what, what can we all be mindful of? I don't know. I just need to sort of finish some things and do things that are quicker. You need some <laughs> deadlines. Yeah, I definitely need some deadlines. That's that's the thing that I I am entirely lacking. And I think um I think more deadlines will make me a lot more productive. Okay. So my, should... my my deadline suggestion, which is like you can you can take or leave this, yeah. but um and I've used this and it works, um, is make a five hundred pound bet with someone that you'll make a certain date. And if you don't, then you have to pay them £500. Yeah, that's good. Because it's like positive deadlines don't work. You I should just have, I should just tell Steve to give me more grief. Steve Thonk, who runs, yeah, who Steve runs Thonk. Thonk. You know, he's essentially my customer. Yeah. So he should be giving me a hard time. But yeah. given he is, I think, as bad as me. Oh, dear. You know, he's just released the these um, really nice uh, drum modules. Clock. I based the fact on, I was weirdly I've just been emailing yeah. him as I was walking over because I was I was asking a few questions. So I think Sorry. he's possibly been developing them as long as I've been developing this one, which means he's got no, you know, moral basis to give me grief. Well hang on, but his, in all fairness, his thing is like an algorithmic like platform for like drum synthesis that like, users will be able to like algorithmically upload their own algorithmic drum mod yeah like, on a radio synthesis. music module is it yeah <laughs> <laughs> on a modified radio music yeah so, but whereas this is just a, come on this is just this is a, this no, is no, a, I agree I'm a, not a headphone I'm, preamp I'm, and I'm, I'm not come I'm on. not disputing that <laughs> but like I mean this is difficult everything is difficult like, but it's not that it's difficult it's the deadline that's the point is it's, yeah. it's for me well, so it's, make it's the like, pound bet like yeah. you know uh, the best way of doing the five hundred pound bet is you yeah. do it with a friend who also has something else they need to do. That's true. So that you 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 make a mutual bet. Well, I will do. It maybe myself. we should just maybe we should just bet my royalties with Steve. <laughs> <laughs> if I deliver this by this day, you pay me for it. If you don't, then I don't get paid, and you can make as many of them as you want. <laughs> That's probably quite a good idea. <laughs> That's like where, where the someone did point out quite rightly. If you've got a new music album to finish, all you should just do is just book a date with your mastering engineer yes and then if you don't have well that's it i literally don't have any deadline at all and i think and because there are things that i design that people are very happily making and enjoying and, mm. and finding new interesting things to do with and they're, they're that continues and that's all you know yeah. that's all going along quite happily yeah um so and also i think i do think there is a slight issue of i don't feel like I used to feel like, oh, I should be making new stuff every year and doing new stuff all the time. You go to Superboot and you think, there are probably enough modules. <laughs> it's probably fine. And, you know, maybe we should, maybe we should all have a, a quota. So, oh like, if, I, if Music Thing was allowed to have, like, six modules, 
And then, I mean, mine obviously all become open source. So we could, this would be great. You say every module manufacturer can produce six modules. After that, out. it's got to go to open source. And um, they can obviously bring them back, the old ones. You might just, you know, make noise. We'll just go, yeah, we're, we're done now, to be honest. That's it. We've got a DPO and a maths, <laughs> and we are finished. And yeah, we'll see, that's it. I'm see you later. And, yeah, I think that might be good. It'd make Superbooth a lot simpler, more straightforward. Shut it all down. Well, not Burn shut it, it down. No, no, but like, like, no, no, not shut it down. They've just got to decide which ones. It's one in, one out. One in, one so, out. So, you know, make noise would be going, okay, I've got this amazing new idea, but am I going to kill a, you know, woggle bug now? Mm. That needs to go. Mm. And if you decide you want to do a version two or something, obviously you're killing off version one, which is fine. Yeah. I think that'd be quite a good idea. Fair enough. You know, it would, would focus the mind a bit. <laughs> That doesn't work in this sort of commercial age that we live in. I understand to, yeah, that there may be commercial problems with commercial this. Commercial reasons. But it, it would make it very hard to buy buffered malts as well. Yeah. Why? Because you... <laughs> he's going to have that in their range. Yeah, that's true. You know, everyone yeah, puts one in when they want to have their seventh or eighth you module. You probably encourage itself. people to DIY more because there'd be no buffered malts. But well, you've got to make one. Yeah. It might inspire more people. And there would be very good designs available. Mm -hmm. So you've, yeah, I think that's... Yeah, no, that's great. You can use right. your influence in the scene to get that, to get that to work. <laughs> Sort of like some kind of like China sort of one, you know, one child policy. Or exactly. Whatever, you know, like maybe one just one module. Yeah, the one module. Imagine there person. would be, what, 300 modules exist in the world. Oh, my God. That would make And it really would be one in, one out. But it would be so much simpler. You just no, be like, main, make main noise would be like, we've got our new module. It is a DPO. And you're like, okay. Cool. That's it. And no Stop. one could ever post those like things of what should I put in my rack? Because there won't be anything left. Put in the right logic I suppose there. it would just make the second-hand market absolutely mind-boggling. So it'd be more like the art market, wouldn't it? It yeah. would be right. All everything would become really, ass. really expensive. And yeah. Rare. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure that that I don't think we should do that in 2019. <laughs> but I definitely recognise that we should all be thinking about what you said about. Don't just assume that the solution to your problem is buying another thing. I do. It yeah, could I also do. be using other things. I mean, I've said this many times, but it's like. That's sort of the point of modular is that you create new functionality by yeah. cooking up a new way of hooking everything up. And you don't need a module to do a certain thing. You can make it out of existing modules yeah. that might be smaller and more boring on their own. Yeah. Um, you asked me um, when CV Freaks was up, you were like, you should do a talk about yeah. everything that you've learned about uh, from talking to people, like 50 yeah. things I've learned, like you do your 50 things. I definitely don't think I've learned 50 things. From, you must have done. From, I've, but I've learned a number of things. I actually did write down some things. Yeah. Cause it, what I recognise is there are some common themes, um, and I can certainly like mention those. Um, I was listening to some of my like outros to these episodes as well, like reminding myself, but definitely the biggest, most common theme is that people don't want to use computers. Yes. That's what people say. They say... Um, I was tired of looking at a computer and I want to play with something that isn't. Yeah. You know, um, I find weirdly for myself, I don't suffer from that in the sense like... Because the man just bought a Circulon. Circulon, yes, I did just buy a Circulon. <laughs> but that doesn't mean... But I also, I've actually completed an album very recently and I've done it all through the computer. You know, and I... <clears throat> the computer is a sensational and fantastic instrument yeah. and it's... And actually, weirdly, like the thing I did, like one of my revelations was Analog Lab, you know, like the Archeria software, oh, yeah, which is just yeah. presets. Yeah. It's just exclusively presets. Yeah. And having just presets at your fingertips, I found incredibly liberating. Do you think there's a risk we're going to get thrown out of, um, you know, Modular Synthesizer Club? Because, because we spent we most just... of the time talking about DX7s, and now you're oh, like, like, the real trick is yeah. Three presets. presets. Yeah, <laughs> hell yeah. I'm like, <laughs> I just feel that people... Anyone, all right, sound design is a wonderful thing, but yeah. like another theme I've learned is people is meeting people who separate the sound design process from the writing process. Right. Yeah, these two yeah. things are different. And obviously, and as I've said many times now, it's like the sound design is writing sometimes. You know, if it's coming up with an interesting sound that is just what you want to listen to in the yeah. background, then they're, they're part of the same process. There is the writing process. But if you have. If you make music which could work being played on any other instrument, yeah. I if your music like with Aphex Twin, where you get an orchestra playing Aphex Twin, I would argue if it's possible yeah. that your music could be transcribed to be played by an orchestra, yeah. then you may benefit from 
separating the two processes. If yeah. you find it, if you find it, because just, just distracting, having a modular where what I really need is an 808 kick drum. I should just use a friggin' 808. I shouldn't like yeah. synthesize an 808 kick drum. At least I shouldn't synthesize it at the point when I'm trying to like just come up with a really funky beat. It's like, you should well, just focus yeah, on the and it's Yeah, I think there's, there's a lot in that. There's also the way I think understanding how you listen to things. So I've been playing with like really, really simple drum circuits. So one of the, one of the things that I've been interested in since I first read about it was a thing that a guy called Paul de Marinis, who's got his book there somewhere. He did a thing called, which he called in a not particularly correct sounding in this decade. He made a box called a pygmy gamelan. Um, and the idea of this was it had five little sort of drum oscillators in it. And it had a, a shift register, like in a Turing machine, but it just had essentially noise going into that. Mm. And so it produces rhythms that are basically just tuned. They're like, they're, they're sort of probably like the toms on a 808, mm. that sort of sound. And I started, I've been experimenting with this using um, uh, the old Nord modular software mm. to kind of prototype it. And you realize when you start listening to it, that there are things that your brain very quickly starts hearing as a kick drum. Hmm. And you start to sort of, you, you just sort of start to map rhythms and patterns onto it that are not necessarily there, but you're hearing them and your brain is kind of passing in that way. And I think that's very different from the, I have to tune this kick drum to sound exactly like the perfect kick drum. It's like the piece of music will emerge at the end. I guess it's like Aphex in lots of ways. The music is so complicated, but your brain can sort of Just, yeah. navigate it and understand it. Mm. And it's a long way from that, what is the perfect mm. answer. Like when I, Whenever I'm designing things, I always kind of worry that somebody will listen, will misunderstand it and think it is something that is is more precise or more specific than... It should be, you know, like... You mean as in it's meant to be better than... <laughs> no, I mean in that it's more... It, that it's something that you use to polish or fine-tune something, whereas actually if, if it's not that at all, it's something that's that you're using for creating the broad structure of something. Like like if somebody wants to use a Turing machine to try and make sample, make sequences and write notes into it. Yeah. That's obviously a very fundamental misunderstanding of it. But Or when people got the radio music and were like can i do sample accurate drum sequences of mm. this and you're like you might be able to but it's not really what yeah. the idea of it was like you should probably there's probably you know, i haven't sat there interest. and said that's what it's supposed to be for mm. um and so there's something about that the 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 where the precision is and where the where the levels of effort and kind of polishing mm. are I, I suppose i worry about people tuning their kick drums for years to try and get the right I briefly experimented with tuning kick drums this year and yeah. just gave up after a while so <laughs> it just doesn't need it I think um, really the the sort of major thing which is something because there was this there was a poll recently of like top personalities in music industry did you win? Uh, no I didn't win um, I was in the list which no, is not very that you're sweet. bitter no I'm not bitter <laughs> Um, that's not why I bring this up. Um, <laughs> but there was a, a poll of like top 10, it was like 12 nominees. But not one nominee of them was a woman. Yeah. It was literally blokes. Yeah. Um, and it was just like that. Obviously, we know that's a problem. But that's a real fucked up thing. Yeah, that so is the, fucking yeah, shit. That's the thing like, I've been thinking about constantly. That's, like, that's yeah. actually like, like genuinely, like we we do like and i and i say this and it's very like easy for me to say it because i'm not doing enough like for example one of the big issues i think is that you know we've now got 11 this will be the 12th podcast yeah but only a very few of those podcasts have had women on them yeah and it's like you know and actually i have i've been trying to but i actually don't that's the problem i don't know that many women who are like oh I'm contactable, you know what I mean? As a as yeah. a person who's really in this sort of relatively niche sort of sector, I'm not the guardian. So when I come knocking on someone's door, then that's not really very interesting to people to perhaps but be think, promoted on a podcast that's relatively just... niche. But it's it, we like talking to Zoe and Nina. Like they're talking yeah. about the fact that the 
two things of how like you know is is to think about the way that that people use language you know particularly as blokes using language yeah on forums to, to subtly imply that a certain thing is not for women, yeah. which is quite a common thing of like, hey guys, you know, don't know. Yeah. It's like, I'm addressing a room, but it's a bit rude that you're not acknowledging that it isn't just guys. And so yeah. people would say, well, just the word, just I guys, know. you know, and sometimes you could refer to a collective group that includes yeah, yeah. women as guys, but it's just, it's one of those things. And it's a good example that one, because it is one that's so easy to say, oh, that's just trivial. It's just not important. But it is, it's an indicator. If somebody tells you it's important, it's probably because mm. it's important. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and as a bloke, it's not really your your role or exactly, to, to yeah. refute that. And it's also to say it's only one part of a... It's a small part, but it's a part of that. And then when the person goes into a shop and someone's, like, belittling them or, yeah. you know, like there's a, a man and a woman stood there and the woman's asking the question, the person replies to the man. I've heard that. I, I've, thing that's, so I've seen that happen... <laughs> Outside this, what I've seen that happen professionally, I've been in in meetings where I'm so I'm a consultant as my day job. I'll be in a meeting with a client who has hired my services to come and work for them, and we're talking to another person as a third party. So as far as I'm concerned, clearly the senior person in the room is the person who's hired me and is paying me, and the person answers you know the woman asks a question and the person answers to me and it's just and i remember that happened this year and you were just like what and after the meeting we were just like what on earth was going on there that was really peculiar why was this person there? but i, I think it's subconscious like Arr! i like, think it is mad. it is the you know one of the things that really i think is the is the thing to be solved you know in this in this scene and it's super booth this year i did find pretty relentless the kind of you know, middle-aged guys in grey t-shirts speaking yeah. as a middle-aged man in a grey t-shirt. Yeah, yeah. Um, There's two, two and white I, dudes sat yeah. around the table like we... Yeah, yeah exactly. I, I don't... And I, like, and I, the, the, only, the only sort of answer I have for it is that it is... It's just really hard work for us to do. So if if we... You know, when I when I organise the talks for, um, uh, for CV Freaks... There are an awful lot of blokes in grey t-shirts who yeah. I can ask to come and talk, and they'll probably be fine. But I don't want to do that. I want to yeah. try and have a well, broader so range of people. The, who's the musician, that lady who did that insane thing with like the like light electricity on the yeah, table? Yeah, exactly. So she was fantastic. But we also we had a really interesting talk this round, um, which was a woman called Amy, who's a uh, trained as a sound engineer. She was describing how she basically came out top in her year at whichever sound engineer degree school it was uh, and found she couldn't get a job afterwards. She talked about that experience of you turn up to a, to a gig to play and the, the person comes on and says, yes, the sound engineer is going to be along soon. Mm. Uh, and, you know, she was essentially saying, you know, I couldn't get a job, so I had to go and do a PhD. So I'm not doing my PhD because that's, you know, and I think partly that's because then that will show them because I've got a PhD. Yeah. Um, and just those sort of practical difficulties that make it, you know, it's like, why, it's, why it's, it's not a kind it's un, of... It's just so brutally unfair. Yeah. It's like, and it, I think it's, you know, the, the takeaway is to tr just to try and make things more welcoming in a not condescending way. Yeah. I do I think, think it's just, there's a chunk of it is just that work. You know, when, when I went to um, the Loop Festival in, in Berlin yeah, a couple yeah. of years ago, you know, they must have had 40-odd panels. They didn't have a single panel that was all men. Yeah. They didn't have, you know, probably half the people moderating those panels, you know, chairing them were women. Uh, and it meant the entire place had a very, very different mm. vibe. And it, and it was, you just constantly met really, really interesting people. For, and, and it wasn't just, you know, men and women. You just met constantly met interesting people from different backgrounds. Mm. Um, and I think that's what you we want to try and get to in this sort of scene. And I, I, I think partly it's also about broadening the subject matter, you know. So... Again, it would be very easy to say this is a modular event, so I need to have 
six modular manufacturers talking about modules they have made. Mm. If you do that, it will be men. Yeah. Because that's basically what that group predominantly, is. Predominantly. Yeah, it is. So I doing those C V Freaks things, I was like the theme of this is it's stuff that I'm interested in, which is about electronics or music, mm. probably. Which, which is, is all related and relevant. Which are, and actually if somebody came along and wanted to talk about something that was slightly outside that, but I thought it was going to be interesting mm. and that I thought the audience would find interesting you put them on yeah. um, and so I think there's there's partly just the, the we can reach into broader topics yeah. to involve more people yeah, yeah because then you, you can you can broaden it and then you're introducing people into this world and you're introducing people in this world into a broader that's a very, very good point yes um, who weren't people who were necessarily aware of modular yeah but their work is relevant or it has a relevance yeah to resonance but also the point is what I'm trying to do there is a piece of entertainment I want to entertain people for mm. two or three hours who come along to an event and so the, my job is to make it as entertaining and interesting as possible. Mm. Um, and you have to keep it, keep it broad. But yeah, it is a, it's a really, really difficult challenge. And I know, um, you know, the Duff who runs the Brighton Modular Meet will, you know, has exactly the same challenge and is working out how to try and make that more, you know, broader and more diverse. And you see, it's, it's partly... You know, you sometimes uh, the the thing I really remember from which was a, a good example of those tiny points. I remember at Superbooth this year, uh, seeing a big group of people who I think was the it was probably some of the Ableton team. So it's a group of three or four women walking through the, and the people I've been talking to earlier. So you know, where are you going? Oh, we're going up to the to the bar at the top, and there's a bar right up in the in the mm. top of the venue. Why are you going there? Oh, because um, we want some wine. Why isn't, you know, one, one, there's, you know, four or five bars around Super Booth. They all sell beer and nothing else. They sell beer and Club Mate and nothing else. That's true. And at Loop, they, which was in the same venue they used to do in, they had beer and wine and other things to drink. And so the person making that decision about stocking the bars has said completely reflexively and naturally, it's not going fill it with beer mm. and that doesn't mean all women want to drink wine and all men want to drink beer yeah. but it's those tiny tiny little nudges that I would never have thought of myself yeah. but seeing that kind of there's a tiny level of irritation a tiny level of thought and it's I mean it's exactly the same as when you get into into accessibility for events and you get into mm. you know there's lots of different things there but i'm not suggesting i would have spotted that mistake i yeah. certainly didn't go to the bars and go oh look they've only got beer yeah yeah no i know <laughs> i've been to those bars because yeah. oh, all i wanted was a beer yeah <laughs> exactly um but it was you know it's it's just thinking of making that connection and thinking there's a better way of doing it i suppose hmm. tom thanks very much <laughs> see you next year see you next year cheers Tom. Yes, that's Mr. Tom Whitwell and myself, once again in Herne Hill, in his little shed. I did not have chicken this time. I had a full English and a local calf. So, yeah, I think 2019 has got to be a year where, speaking for myself entirely, that I make more of an effort to try and address some of the gender imbalance. How can I help? What can I do? And so... Uh, I guess one of the first things is I met a lady at the Edinburgh Festival of Sound just in the latter half of last year. And the organisation she works for is called the Yorkshire Sound Women's Network, which is kind of an awesome title because my sort of joke interpretation was it's just really sound women in Yorkshire, which they definitely are. And so the Yorkshire Sound Women's Network organised meetups, events, workshops all over the north, um, with its main goal being, obviously, to encourage women to explore practices in music technology and audio technology, uh, of which there is no experience necessary. Um, they, they're covering all kinds of things in the workshop, from sort of live coding to music production, um, all manner of things. So check out what they do. Obviously, if you just Google Yorkshire Sound Women's Network, it will come up. And so I want to try and start actually doing something. So what I did first is I've made a donation. So I actually have donated the sponsorship proceeds to this episode, the entire sponsorship proceeds, plus some extra. 
um, to the Yorkshire Sound Women's Network. But it's not really about donating money to the Yorkshire Sound Women's Network. It's about doing stuff. The thing that they asked me to mention, um, and which is definitely what I think you need to check out, is the Audio Equity Pledge. And it's basically a guide which is written by one of the Yorkshire Sound Women Network directors, Liz Dobson, about what you can actually do. So it's it's a pledge to do with understanding the problems and understanding actions that you can take. There are things that it could be in it, you know, from amplifying what they do and sharing it on social media to to just getting involved and actually sharing your skills and your abilities that you may have for the benefit of all. And so go and look for the Audio Equity Pledge. Google Audio Equity Pledge and read the document. There's more to it than I can read out here, but I'll read a little bit, which was the summary of the three action headlines. They are collaborating. What you can do to offer your support to feminist collectives who are already helping girls and women in sound. Adopting new interventions and also understanding and addressing unconscious bias. Perspective. Doing your own research, checking your assumptions and recognising that women of colour are subject to a double hit of bias due to racial discrimination. And changing environments, that is, creating environments that are truly fit for purpose. And so Liz and the crew invite you to make an audio equity pledge, hashtag, to read this document and identify three or more interventions that you would like to make to supporting women in sound, to post this document on your website and blog with a summary of your interventions using he for she and audio equity pledge, and to post an update six months later. Please do something, because if you're leaving this work to a few, almost always women, then you are part of the problem. As blokes, it's very easy to just roll over and think that stuff is going to change without you having done anything. But that's lazy, and it won't. (laughs) So what can you do to help? Google Audio Equity Pledge and check it out. I'm going to do it. You should too. Cheers. Bye.